Hello and welcome to episode 2 of the CMC tutorial. In this one we're going to be looking through all of the networking stuff, we're going to be explaining how networking in games works, how the character movement component handles it, and we're going to be doing a full C++ implementation of a network predicted movement system. I've marked the various sections so you can skip ahead or backward and forward, whatever you want to do, depending on how much knowledge you already have about network prediction in Unreal Engine. And of course, if you're just here for the blueprint stuff and all that kind of thing, I still recommend checking out this tutorial and following along just so you can understand the basics and the concepts, even if the C++ might look a little bit scary. Don't worry. In episode three, we're going to be doing that full blueprint only solution with like a tiny little bit of C++ to help you out in your journey. But for now, as mentioned, this is a full C++ tutorial and well, let's get into it with what network prediction is and how network movement works in some of your favorite games today. I mean, hasn't changed much since the early Quake days and stuff like that, and Counter-Strike and all those kind of things that introduced these concepts initially. So, without further ado. Let's start off by just seeing what's available out of the box, right? This is just the same project we started off earlier. Same little setup. What we're going to do is we're going to just change the network mode. Let's make it two players. And the network mode we're going to say listen server. So therefore, one of these little windows are going to be the server, and one's going to be the client. So here you can see the server on the main window over here, and over here, you can see the client. Make it a little bit bigger. So what happens on the client, right? I can move around. The server can see I'm moving around. Everything's nice and smooth. I can jump, quite an exaggerated jump. And that's all networked and smooth, right? On the server side, we have a very similar situation. Can move around, can jump, all's fine and dandy. Let's actually just go ahead and make these separate windows. <laughs> a little bit easier to cat to move around then. So once again, client on the right, server on the left. So as you can see, on the server, I can move around, the client sees what I'm doing. I have all the same operations on both, and they're both super smooth. But of course, in an ideal environment, there'd be zero ping, right? You wouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. But in the real world, there's always a bit of ping. You know, the cloud. It's great and all, but there's always a bit of latency. Depending on where you are in the world, it can be quite bad, you know? Like, for example, I'm in South Africa at the moment. If I want to play online games, I'm always sitting around 170 to 200 ping. Worst case scenario, you've got 250 ping. That's quite bad. So you can imagine if the server was constantly waiting for me, or I was constantly waiting for the server to acknowledge my moves, it would feel pretty bad. Oops, I clearly hit tilde. It would feel pretty bad. I'd be lagging. I'd, I'd, I'd push. I'd push the button, and nothing would happen for a full what two hundred milliseconds, and that that feels pretty bad. You know, like you can imagine that that'd be awful, an awful experience. Let's go ahead and emulate lag at the moment. If you type packet lag, you'll see net emulation, uh, em emulation packet lag. And let's say let's let's add that ping in two hundred ping, the ping that I play on usually. Oh, all fine and dandy on my side. Doesn't feel any different. I can still jump. I can still move. Everything's instantaneous response on my end, on the client end. But if you see, I'm going to hit the button now. You can see there's a bit of delay on the server compared to the client. This, you can actually see it a lot easier if I increase the amount of lag. Let's say 500 ping. So now you can really see how long it takes for the server to actually pick up that I've moved compared to the other side. But on my side, it's still nice and smooth. Everything's perfect. And we can do one more little thing here called corrections. Except spell it correctly. And let's say, let's put, turn those on. Now, network corrections effectively are just a way for the server to control me so that I don't do anything funny. Because you can imagine if, if the server believed everything that I did on my end, imagine how bad cheating would be, right? So, network corrections are basically just how it resets your moves if you make a mistake. Like if I bump into these, these are not network predicted. These are not networked properly. So therefore, something on my screen could be different to the, to the server. Check out the server side here. Technically, the box is right here. You know, on my side, the box is that side. So let's say this is the situation right here, right? If I don't know what's going on my side, I don't know that the box is there but on the server on the box. So therefore, you can see on the server side, I hit the box and therefore it corrected me because the server is authoritative. The server, what the server says goes. So you can really start to see a little bit of a pattern here with how the server corrects, what happens with the client forward predicting, and all this kind of stuff. So let's have a little look at a little diagram to discuss what's going on here, right? And also just throw in some information we learned from the previous episode. 
So let's go ahead and depaint again. <laughs> Our favorite little thing. Because remember, what was happening here is obviously that the server is not acknowledging every single move every single time before allowing you to move. It's allowing the client to forward predict. And that's why it's called network prediction. Kind of a, a weird name for it, but you know, it's kind of like guessing. The client guesses at what's going on in the world based on its current information, but it might be a little bit out of sync with the server because the server is currently still running through moves in the past and acknowledges them as it goes. So basically, what's actually happening, right? Because remember, going back to the old episode, the, the, the sort of the, the pattern, the stack, is we have play intent, input, the acceleration, the velocity, the movement mode to actually run through the world and do stuff such as walking, allowing you to move around, climb over rocks, all that kind of stuff. And that's basically the, the process, right? That's remember, so we did, that's, that's how it always works. It does all this kind of stuff, does the physics and then allows the plan to move. And as we know, this is called a move for that particular tick. And it allows any pawn to do this, whether you're the server playing as a listen server or you're a client running on your own little instance. This is always the code that runs, right? And like I said, what's happening with the clients is that they are forward predicting, they are guessing, there are a couple of ticks ahead. So every one of these moves, therefore, is kind of like just a state, right? You have your input, you have your velocity, you have your final location, you have your old location, you have all that kind of like information ready to go. And so therefore, you can imagine that this information, if you're the client, needs to be sent to the server. But on your end, you have done these moves, everything's fine and dandy. So what you're doing is you're actually collecting a list of moves on the client. Let's say you have a couple of moves. Let's say you have about you're about five moves ahead of the server, right? Every move will have a timestamp for a particular you know time in the engine in, in the game world. It's gonna have, like I said, the velocity information, the input information. It's gonna have the the location information. Basically, an input state indicating what the client did initially, an output state indicating effectively what the client's at currently and it's sending all this information for each one of these moves through to the server on the server side well, actually let's rather just do it here on the server side it's busy running through these moves and saying okay ah, uh, yeah sure i'm gonna run this exact same move but in my particular world state i'm the boss i tell you what's right or wrong okay cool yes i've done this move therefore yes i'll acknowledge it i'll act the move and therefore we'll get rid of that move move on to the next one all right, what happened on this one? Okay, the client did something here. Cool, that's fine. All good and dandy. Act that move to... Okay, now the next move. Whoa, 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 whoa. Something's wrong here. Something's very wrong here. Hold on, the client's moved and they've hit that box. And on my side, the box is there, but the client did something else. The client claims that they're a little bit for more forward ahead than they should be. But on my side, there was a box. No, 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 this is incorrect. And what it does is it does that little correction. It checks the timestamp, all that kind of stuff. And what happens is it just sort of cancels out this move and says, no, 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 that's not right. That's not right. Therefore, I'm going to tell you what your current state should be. I'm going to tell you what position to correct to. I'm going to tell you what information to change on your side and update your various other moves in your queue with. And then you're going to go ahead and you're going to replay your moves. And that's another new concept called move replaying, which we briefly touched on in the previous episode. And what that means is that once you've had a correction from the server, once you've been told, no, no, you need to reset and do things again, obviously you don't want the client to, it, well, basically it would feel absolutely terrible if every single correction resulted in a bunch of your moves being cancelled out. Imagine a couple of milliseconds worth of moves just being cancelled out and being reset and teleported back and everything that you've done since then is just completely erased. That'd be awful, right? So what it doesn't say is that obviously you have all this information still, you have your input state, you have all this information available to you. So when the client receives this correction, it goes to the timestamp and says, okay, I have a couple of moves ahead of me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fix myself up here. I'm gonna fix all that information required that the server told me to fix. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replay all of these moves within this tick. And therefore I'm gonna move this one and this one and this one, but based on the new state that the server put me in. So therefore, let's say you are in the map and you moved from here to here. And the server said, no, 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 you bumped to the box. You're actually back here or you booped to the side over here. And now you're going to be able to replay your moves again with the same stuff and end up where the server expects you to end up. And of course, the client might see this correction, but the point is that it's possible that the client won't even notice most corrections. Or at least they shouldn't notice most corrections unless something really bad happened. Or you have really bad ping, or you have packet loss, or something like that. That's when you start noticing these big, big rubber bandy kind of corrections. But in this case, so yeah, that's going to make sure that the client feels as smooth as possible, even in the situation where 
They've made a mistake. The server said no, 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 and corrected them back to a different location. So this move replaying just kind of saves you. It just makes things feel way, way, way better. So therefore, like, you can kind of see how in modern games, perhaps, the idea of the box might still exist, an issue where the server, something occurs on the server that the client doesn't know about, therefore resulting in a correction. We can imagine the same thing can apply to abilities, right? Now we're getting a bit more complex. Let's say a stun occurred on the client that they didn't know about, and they just dashed or, or moved ahead or something along those lines. But now the server says, no, 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 you were stunned. Reset back. Sorry, you know, <laughs> I'm the boss. Someone else stunned you. You couldn't move. And therefore resets you back and then of course we'll do the whole thing we replace the moves of the gap but if you're stunned you know they might just you might not move at all and a really 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 great video for understanding how network code moves or rather this network prediction stuff works is a video from the overwatch team and i think going through that video and also going through a few more of the overwatch team's videos on network prediction and how they handled their system is actually a really really great idea to to help you understand how all this works but also how a modern system could can absolutely sing like they do crazy stuff like network predict their projectiles and all those other crazy little things that just makes the client experience feel amazing like like i said even from south africa playing overwatch is great fun because everything feels responsive everything feels right and so i'll link those videos down below for you to watch so you can understand network prediction a bit more but also start giving you ideas of how gameplay abilities and movement code can kind of interact but on that note, uh, gameplay ability system in Unreal Engine and the CMC, as mentioned, they don't they don't really communicate too well together. But there are hacks and ways to do it. It's, it's that's probably one of the more complex topics: how to sort of marry the two together, and whether or not they actually can be married at times. But uh, but like I said, the, hopefully there's better systems coming out at some point in Unreal to sort of marry the two together. And we're starting to see uh, things in that vein. We recently had the network prediction plugin. Unfortunately, that's been a little bit uh, stuck in the water for a while. So they might be working on something else for marrying the two concepts together. But for the time being, yeah, like I said, watch watch those videos so you can understand how like a, f a fully integrated system can work with gameplay abilities and movement. But let's return to the topic at hand here, which is just movement, just the character movement component. Let's not get too crazy with abilities and how to create this huge architecture and all that kind of stuff at the moment. Let's just focus on the main topic. <laughs> but it's kind of plain to see that this is the main pattern. This is the main concept. You have your move containing, or let's just say any kind of data indicating player intent, what the client claims happened, and then what the server says actually happened. That's basically what it is. And if the, if the server and client disagree, there's a little correction from the server, and then they replay their moves, and everything's happy from that point on. That's, that's the main pattern with everything. Whether or not you're talking about movement or abilities or anything like that, this is the, the important part. So the key topic there that you're gonna run through a lot in networked gameplay is player intent. Because player intent does not always translate into the final output case the client's expecting. Because remember, the server and client can disagree. But the idea of player intent goes a bit further because what you're doing is you don't want the client dictating certain things about the move to the server. Let's say the client submits something like a launch, so a massive velocity change that the server then says, okay, yeah, cool, I completely believe that this happened. But meanwhile, that is an ability. That The launch is actually an ability that has a cooldown timer. Now, if the client's able to send this information through every single move to the server, that's cheating, right? And the server's just believing like, oh yeah, sure, I can see you've act added a launch into this event, therefore I'll launch you every single move like you said. That can be cheating because it need the server needs to go and actually check that timer and see, oh, do you actually have the ability to use this launch? And if you don't, it can correct you. So you wanna be careful what information you trust from the client because the client can cheat very, very easily in most situations. That's why you always get player intent. In this case, an input state. Our inputs are very important because inputs are quite pure. The player is gonna push the forward move button and then they're gonna to expect to move forward. And now that's pretty safe, right? Because all they wanna do is indicating intent and therefore they're gonna run through the velocity change, the movement mode, the physics and all that kind of stuff. And it should be fine and dandy. They're not telling the server, oh, here's a massive launch event and change my velocity to this, or I demand you change my velocity to this every single tick and all that kind of stuff. So that's why you gotta be careful what information you send. This is gonna become quite important when we get to a new concept, well, a relatively new concept in the character movement called packed movement. 
that allows you to send extra information through to the server beyond just little tiny input flags. But we're going to get into that when we get to the code. In fact, I do believe that this is enough information to go on. So now that we've been over those core concepts, you can kind of see how that overarching design is quite engine agnostic. You can, you can immediately start putting a little algorithm and stuff together, right? Because imagine you're going to need a data structure for your moves that are saved by the client and handled by the server. You're going to need a, a function that sends from client to server. You're going to need a function that allows the server to act every single move. You're going to need a way for the server to realize that something's wrong based on the output state of the current move and then give a correction to the client. And like that's there's a few other little things in there, right, that you can think of. Like imagine if the server's output state just barely doesn't match up with the client, obviously you're allowed a little bit of error tolerance. Uh, I think it's actually quite a, a small tolerance in Unreal Engine at, at, like a sort of a, at a baseline, but that can be changed by you, obviously, if you really want to, but like that's probably a good thing, right? Not, not to allow too much of a discrepancy, right? I mean, it's pretty good practice. One important thing to realize about, uh, about Unreal Engine is that out the box, it doesn't actually have server authoritative rotation, which obviously is desirable for something like a shooter. Because imagine if you're, you're playing a shooter, right? And you've got your little crosshair and you're, you're aiming at some person in the middle of the screen. And all of a sudden the server corrects your aim. You're like, what? What's going on over here? So that's actually entirely the reason why a lot of games, a lot of engines, or especially Unreal Engine to start off with, doesn't actually have rotation authoritative, sorry, server authoritative rotation, just server authoritative location. So that's important to keep in mind here is that you, you, you can turn on authoritative rotation, but like I said, that's that's likely not going to be for your third person action games, for your farming simulators, for your shooter games, because having your rotation, your aim corrected is going to feel terrible. But if you're playing like if you're making a racing game with cars and vehicles or a spaceship or something, then maybe you want to look into correcting rotation because then obviously you're turning at a certain rate you want the guy to well, the client to be in a certain spot at a certain time all that kind of stuff so then yeah then you can go ahead and do that but at the bat most games you shouldn't be correcting rotation just your location like Unreal engine does out of the box so that's a nice little feature right nice little little design trait <laughs> so that's some good information to go on right we can probably close out of, of paint for now go back to our code because Remember our little, uh, let's open up paint again. <laughs> let's, uh, of course, we're going to look at the, the move. Like, what goes into a move? Like we discussed, it's going to have some input state information. Uh, it's going to have some output state information. But also, it's going to be tracking all of the important variables that we need for that particular move to basically work properly on the client and on the server. You want to save out certain information, which you're going to see quite clearly here. So if we go scroll down a little bit, past all the different sections, you can search for and find a little something called f saved move character. And then there we go, there's a little data structure right for just the saved move that we discussed. And here you can immediately see, oh, there's a timestamp like we said, like at a particular time, this is what happened, how much time was allotted for this move, uh, current time dilation, because obviously there's a little bit of like weirdness with networking and stuff like that, but also just some additional stuff, like how, what's your max jump count, how many current jumps are there, just like extra little things. Because this is all stateful information that's quite important to keep track of for when you want to replay the move after a correction and all that kind of stuff. And these are safe to keep track of. The client's not necessarily saying, oh, I've got this many count moves remaining or this many jumps remaining, what, what, what. What's actually happening is the client, remember, is just indicating intent. They are requesting a jump through this variable called B pressed jump. As well as like if they want to crouch, they request the crouch through B wants to crouch. And then of course, the back end kind of figures out, okay, can they crouch, can they not? And this is what allows the server to sort of maintain its own state because the client's not overriding any stateful information on the server. It's just sending through a request, which will allow the client obviously on their end to request the move and then predict ahead, pretending like, okay, yes, I press jump and I'm gonna jump on my end, even though I'm a little bit ahead of the server. And when it gets to the server's time to sort of acknowledge that move, then they're gonna go, okay, at this time, did the player, or was the player able to actually jump? Did they have the rights to do so? And then, of course, if they didn't, you can do a little correction, what 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 But as you can see, that's that's kind of the, the overall thing, right? We, we keep coming back to player intent. The player requests any kind of movement, and then the system handles that movement. That's why it's important to keep track of these input variables, or in case these input flags as well as other little things. So imagine anything related to the move that you want to keep track of, you can just store in the same move. 
uh, what we're going to be doing uh, later on in this tutorial is obviously implementing our own save moves and stuff like that, or rather overriding this class to include new information for us. So we're going to be storing all sorts of stuff there. So you, if you can, if you need something to be stored, yeah, just slap it into the save move and it'll be stored. <laughs> and we'll be getting to that whole implementation in like a little tiny bit. But at the moment, what's nice about this being available to you, all this code here in the back end, is that you can be like, okay, so if I want to implement my own players like a player requested action like a jump or something you can follow the breadcrumbs just based on these variables here you can be like okay where does this variable go where did it come from where did it go <laughs> something something cotton uh and you can just run through the code and see okay well obviously it came from the player and then it got sent to the server how does it get sent to the server oh it gets sent to the server in this spot here water 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 but in our case over here if we actually scroll down to some of these functions within this save move you can start seeing stuff about oh uh, something about get compressed flags and all this kind of stuff. And what are these compressed flags? So now this is an important concept over here. So as you can see, this is just an enum, compressed flags. And all that has in it is just a bunch of stuff such as jump pressed. Oh, okay. So I can see that matches up with our jump pressed over there. We have a wants to crouch. Oh, another little flag. Cool. Uh, and then of course some reverse flags that are just, I don't know, they're not actually used by anything. It's just They just claim to be reserved for some odd reason. And then you get four custom flags to do your own thing. Now you're probably wondering, okay, four flags. So that means I have four more actions that I can send through to this particular system. That doesn't seem like a lot. If I want to add in a dash and then something else and then something else and then something else, and then all of a sudden I want more. I'm like, you're like, oh no, I've run out of, I've run out of flags. What now? Oh no. And that's kind of the issue you ran into for a while up until about 4.26 when they added in a new system as mentioned. So you can see why this was such a limitation, right? I mean, you can do some more fancy stuff and squeeze more in and do other little things, but having just four custom flags, you can kind of maybe use these because they're not really reserved. But imagine just having four custom moves, four custom flags to work with, that's not much because basically this is what's sent through to be client and server every single tick quite often. Um, and what's going on here is a concept called bit shifting. And these are called bit flags. I'm gonna actually include a video down below. I'll mark it clearly in the description for you to go check out what big flags are, how they use, all that kind of stuff, great video. But long story short, there's a concept in networking called a bit rate. And you kind of want to reduce your bit rate as much as possible. Because you can imagine now if you're sending lots of information between client and server every single tick, that's gonna increase your bit rate, right? So now imagine if you want to send through a bunch of Booleans and each Boolean is gonna be, well, each boolean is a byte because the lowest addressable unit amount of space for the operating system to actually allocate is a byte. And so therefore, like, you know, every, every mentioned, every byte is eight bits. So bit shifting is just a way to sort of use one byte of memory, one or one byte variable, and do some fancy magical coding stuff and just throw in eight different flags into those eight bits that are represented by one byte or a variable of one byte in size. So that's what they've done here. And you can kind of see how Epic themselves have allocated it. And these are your eight bytes, sorry, these are your eight bits <laughs> inside of your byte. And you can do some fancy little checks to see which flags are activated, which aren't flag activated. And we're gonna be running through that as well, implementing that and you can just, well, in the end, you can just steal that code. I mean, that's not really something that you need to worry about. <laughs> but yeah, that's the basic quick, quick and dirty explanation of what bit flags are and why we do this. It's basically, instead of using eight booleans of size of like of the size of eight bits each you're gonna have one byte with eight bits and just slap a bunch of those variables inside of it basically just like hiding variables inside of a variable right in a sense that's what we're doing i mean not really the most correct term but it's a good way to think about it so that's what all this is it's just it's just a very fancy way of just reducing your network bandwidth or rather you're reducing how much you hog your network bandwidth, <laughs> reducing your bit rate. <laughs> but like I said, in this invitation, it was limited. You had four extra flags and that's not great. And also what happens if you want to send extra information to, let's say you're not just relying on the basic room mode or something, you want to send extra information from the client through. You want to trust a little bit of extra data from the client or that kind of stuff, right? Well, then you're going to need a different method and that's kind of what epic did they uh they rewrote some stuff and now if i was to scroll up and find i might just skip ahead in the video so where i find this here we are this is the networking function section that's just you had to scroll up a little bit to find it <laughs> 
But here we can see something, a note from Epic saying, deprecated Mubin RPCs, use the packed versions above instead. This, is, this was the old way of doing things, right? Uh, just sending through that data we mentioned before that was available in the save move with compressed flags and all that kind of stuff. And then I recommend using their new version above instead, which allows you to send a lot more information. And if we go up, we can actually immediately see some, you know, already some of the functions we discussed previously with this fantastic diagram that has described a few functions. We can see, oh, this is where the client sends information. This is where the client receives, where the server receives the information. Oh, this is where the, the, thing, the server can actually start acting moves. If something's wrong, they could request the client adjustment, and then the client can replay their moves. And then you can just, you can just go through these functions one by one and just check out how things work and figure out if there's some places that you want to adjust or change the code. Uh, in this tutorial, we're going to be showing a few things, well, some things that you have to change. And then, like I said, if you, if you want to change a few other things, like how the server acknowledges a move, all that kind of stuff, go have a look at these functions, see if there's anything that you need to change. Obviously, all the things that are virtual are, can be changed by you in a child version. So have a look at those. <laughs> and yeah, but like I said, we're going to be going through just the most important things in our implementation, like the things that have to be changed. That just basically says, okay, we have new information in our moves. Uh, this is how you should handle them and stuff like that. So luckily, that's pretty that's pretty easy. We're going to get to that in a second. But yeah, so this is just the section here with packed moves and all that kind of stuff. But if we actually run over here, da -da -da -da, Captain Move Data, and go to definition, you can see there's actually a new class called Character Movement Replication .h which is nice. Nice that it's been like a little isolated in a different class now. But inside this uh, struct over here, you're gonna see it's quite similar to the save moves stuff we did before, right? It's similar sort of format, similar sort of stuff. And it just has a couple of things, like it's tiny, tiny little class. But all it has a little extra information is just some stuff regarding the timestamp like we have in the save move. So about acceleration, about location, control rotation, all those fun stuff. And also our compressed move flags that we discussed previously that are available inside of the save move class and our movement modes and other important stuff. So now you can add whatever you want to this class, basically, which is great. But like I said, be careful what you send through and what you trust from the client, right? But like, yeah, you can add anything. And then handy little function here called serialize, and that serializes basically any of your, your data structures, any of your variable types, all that kind of stuff. It'll send it through booleans, vectors, whatever you want. It'll, it'll handle it for you, the serialize class here. And now you can see why this is so powerful and why we, well, why the system's better. <laughs> It just allow if you know what you're doing with the networking backend, you can do anything now with this with this whole setup, which is great. Before, like I said, you were limited, or you'd have to make your own changes or write your own special modified version of the character movement component or something like that. I had to do that previously with the initial versions of Project Nix because obviously I needed to add in extra gravity information, rotational data, all that kind of stuff from the client. So I had to go and make changes. Obviously, my one was nowhere near as good as this. This is way more optimized and a bit more, you know, AAA, as they say. <laughs> but yeah, well, like I said, great stuff. We're going to get into this. I think at this point, let's just go ahead and start implementing our own solution now. Because if we were to run through all this code, it's going to be bloody hours. We're going to be ch chatting about stuff for ages, uh, like I did in the previous video. <laughs> so let's rather just get to the part that you actually wanted, that you actually came here for, right? Let's go get to the implementation. So to kick off, what are we trying to achieve here, right? Like we obviously want to just add in our own movement modes because those will allow us to do all those fancy little things we saw with the walking and the falling and all that kind of stuff. Then we want to also be able to send through some informational data like here, like jump press, once the crouch. Like if you want to, you know, into sliding, do this kind of thing, what, 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 you want to start sprinting, you kind of want to send those flags through if you want to start flying. Uh, and we know that, that already that these are pretty limited. So we're going to be using something called packed movement, right? So all we're going to be doing is, well, if you think about it, it's not actually too big of a thing because most of the stuff's done for us in the back end. All that we're going to be doing is just adding extra info into what already exists. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be creating new movement modes. We're going to be overriding saved moves. And we're going to be overriding the packed movement as well with all those new variables. And then of course, if you're adding in new variables, all we're gonna do in these functions or in these members is just change up how their internal functions work, how what information gets sent to the server, how we check to see if that data is correct, if we can combine moves, if we can, well, how we serialize those different things. And we're just gonna inform the CMC that we have changed 
we've added new emotes, that we've changed this data, we've changed the packed movement, and therefore we want to use the new packed movement variable instead of the old one. And bam, you know, most of the stuff's already set up for us. We don't have to worry about changing too much in the back end. But we'll get into that. To start off with, let's just go ahead and open up the engine, because all we want to do now is just add in two new classes. We want a custom character moving component so we can change up all those things, and we want a custom character to work alongside it, because that's just good eti etiquette, you know, you want to like change up which character moving component it's currently using, you want to add some extra info into the character, all that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Super, super simple. Head on over to Tools, and click on New C++ Class. Obviously, we don't want to use any of these, because we want to extend from what we have. So let's go to All Classes. And first up, we want a character moving component, right? So you can just type in character move, and it should pop up down here. Now you can go ahead and give it a good name. Let's call this our custom character moving component. Uh, we can leave that in the normal runtime thing, but let's give it a better folder structure, shall we? Let's go ahead and add it into something like a character folder. And we're gonna just be keeping, we're not gonna be doing the public private thing here just to keep it nice and simple. And then we can just go ahead and say create class. And boom, it adds it straight into our little project, into our, well, into our Visual Studio instance running in the background. Now you might get a little compile error as it tries to hot reload. Uh, in fact, I think it already has. So <laughs> the issue with that is that all that's happening is that it's, it's added this little bit in here, this little for the folder structure. But remember, they're inside the same folder, so you don't need this extra little bit. You can just go ahead and delete that part, and it will stop complaining about including the wrong header file. Because here we are now with our custom character moving component. But as mentioned, if we have a custom character moving component, we kind of also want a custom character. Let's go ahead and do that as well. New class. But of course, we already have a character set up, right? And we more or less want to use the same stuff as the other character. So let's just go ahead and look for our character. And remember, if you call, we call this project the CMC tutorial. So that's more or less what our character will be called. But you can just search for character, did a little bit of a scroll, and you can see there's our CMC tutorial character right there. Once again, we're going to want to be adding this into the character folder we created already. You can also go ahead over here and just select the folder. We've really, 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 really changed that. You can see. And let's go ahead and give it another thing called custom CMC tutorial character. Quite a lengthy name, but we'll stick with it. And once again, hit create. And boom, it'll start it up. And once again, the compile will likely fail. But all you need to do, as mentioned, is just get rid of that little character thing over there, the character folder structure. And boom. It should be fine and dandy now. Everything should be nice and happy. So some important things to get started off with, right? Is to add in some boilerplate code to get everything set up. Actually, in fact, a lot of the stuff that we're about to go through is just straight up boilerplate code. It's got the same pattern. You can even just go look at the parent functions of the stuff we're overriding. All you're doing is following their pattern. So a lot of it, like I said, is just boilerplate. So important need to keep in mind, I'm gonna be uploading all of this to a GitHub page and you can just grab the code and add it into your project and extend it and stuff like that. But I think it's still important to just go through it here to understand the flow, the process, and all of that good stuff. Because even if you grab the code, it's possible that you know some things might escape your knowledge and they're like, okay, what's going on here? Why would I do this? And why is our project broken in this way? Or if I were to do this particular thing, where should I do that? You don't wanna get lost, you know, even if you have the code on hand. So yeah, that's why we're gonna go through this like this. And luckily this video is here for you to just reference in the future if you ever get lost somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, I just restarted my Visual Studio instance here and closed the engine because I noticed these uh, curly brackets weren't showing up in the recording. They just were blacked out for some reason. But like, they're back. Welcome back, parentheses. So let's continue on with our little quest over here. So let's navigate over to the custom character and just start doing a little bit of setup, right? So what we want to achieve here, obviously we want to import our custom character component over here, our custom character moving component, and actually set it as the component to use by default. As mentioned, you can now do this in Blueprint since around, I think, 5.0, I'm not sure exactly when it came in, but it's such a useful thing, but we're gonna be doing it here in C++. So first up, we know that the class name, if we grab it over here, is you custom character moving component. We're gonna just forward declare this over here by saying class, putting it in there. This just allows us to forward declare this in the header so that we can actually include this class in our CPP. And there's probably a whole discussion to be had about, you know, header files and the kind of stuff. But long story short, this just prevents you from overloading or bloating your header file with extra includes, which can slow down compile times and all that kind of stuff. So it's just good practice. Just forward declare your classes and then we'll include them over here, which we can do like straight away, basically, because we know we're going to include it eventually. So we can tell they're both in the same folder. So therefore, we can actually just grab this include over here and it'll work just fine and dandy. Bam. Now it's included. We're good to go. So 
little more setup, just some basic stuff, right? All we're going to do is just grab, I'm going to just copy paste <laughs> some stuff over here. Just some boilerplate. Can I just change up the name? The code I'm pulling from is going to be the code that I upload to GitHub, in case you're wondering. Oh, there's a little problem over here, it's just <laughs> we're just being done with the uh, folder structures. We're going to just go one folder down quickly, grab our tutorial character, because it's out of the folder structure. All right, fix that up. So now we have our custom constructor over here, which we can use to set up the moving component. But first of all, since we're going to be using a custom moving component, we kind of want an easy way to grab that info, right? So let's just go ahead and add a little thing over here. You can make this an inline function. But what we're going to do over here, we're just going to grab the correct name, first of all. We're now going to add like a little helper function in just so we can grab that custom component very easily. And you can see I've changed the name to be the same as our custom character movement over here. And all this is going to do is it's going to just cast the existing component to our new component, to the child component we've just created. We could do the little return right here, but let's skip across this edge to the CVP where we're going to implement both of these. And you can see I've done so over here where I've just changed the names and you can see I'm setting up the character moving component to use, let's change it to the correct name, to use this character moving component instead of the default character moving component. Just a little bit of boilerplate code there you can just grab. <laughs> and there we go. Now it's set up to use our new component. And then we can immediately jump over to the actual moving component itself. Our basic setup is done here. More or less, that's all you really need to do just to get <laughs> some functionality going to get the component assigned to your character. Let's go in here to the important part now. So now remember, we're going to be changing up the save move, we're going to be changing the packed move, and then we're going to be uh, overriding a couple of functions so that we can properly use our new data. So first up, let's go and grab our saved move, right? That's one of our important classes for replaying moves, all that good stuff. So I'm just going to copy-paste the important stuff you need. Bam. And we can see we've just overridden a couple of the, uh, the important functions here. Uh, first of all, whether or not we can combine moves together to set moves for and prep move for basically when you're getting ready to replay a move and stuff like that. These will be called and stuff like that to actually populate the data so that you can recreate that move. And then of course, the ability to clear the move. So you can see not that many functions for us to deal with here, right? The get compressed flags, as mentioned, if we go over to the parent over here, is basically where you would go and grab these from the actual compressed flags. And we can see that happening here doing a little operation here, check is the flag jump pressed active, does what B wants to crouch active, and also did that change since last frame, or since the last time we simulated the move, stuff like that. But as mentioned, we're not gonna be really be using these get compressed flags. You can though, remember, we do have space for four custom flags. So if you wanna be particularly network efficient, you could squeeze four flags into this and then use the old way with the compressed flags to bring that across and handle that that way. But in this tutorial, we're gonna be just doing everything the packed movement way, basically the new way, just to encapsulate everything in the same environment in a sense. But like I said, we are technically gonna be wasting these flags in that case, but you can you can always use them if you really want to, but I don't know, it's up to you. I don't, I don't I think it's nice to have everything in one place so that everything's consistent, you know? Let's do it that way. <laughs> but moving on, you can kind of see why we're using this class, right? Because this is the class where all the moves are allocated and saved on the client so you can replay it after a server correction. And as once again, you can see there's tons and tons of variables. Well, you know, a fair amount of variables in here about velocities and timestamps, stamps and all that good stuff. But importantly, we're tracking player intent, remember? Do we press jump? Do we want to crouch? That reflects the flags that we showed down here in the compressed flags because we want that simulation information to be able to reciprocate or rather to act on what the player intends to do. And when we replay those moves, obviously you wanna you know, track what did the player want to do in that turn and can they actually do that again? Can they actually perform that action? So that's why we're tracking those as well. That's all we're gonna be doing in the save move on our side over here in our custom one, in our child. But before we start adding extra variables in yeah, obviously first of all design our system, right? We have to design what are we intending to do? What do we wanna do? But before we can really get to that, we have to first, you know, first get through the, the packed movement overrides. We need to make sure that's fine and dandy, able to accept all of our information that we need to send across the server. And also we need to tell the system what network prediction data to use. For Well, in this case, all we're doing is saying, use my new custom save move instead of my saved character move, well, the, the, the classical parent F save move character. 
And the same thing goes for the packed movement. So it's just a little bit more setup involved, right? So we're obviously going to need a constructor. And one of the things that you want to, obviously, if, you, if you're doing this kind of stuff, you want to make friends, right? You want to make friends with your, your your the classes that you're putting in because, you know, video games work on fairy dust and magic. So to befriend the machine is how you can make better games. So we do a friend class, F custom move. In, in reality, though, this actually just allows <laughs> the, the custom save move to grab private uh, variables and functions from this class over here. <laughs> But still, video games do run on uh, fairy dust and magic in case you're wondering how games are made. Uh, but moving on, let's go ahead now and actually do the packed movement stuff we just discussed, right? Let's go and add those in. But let's not forget that little part that tells the system which new F save move to use. In this case, it'll be using our F custom save move. And that's what it allows us to do here in the class prediction data. There we go, now the save move is basically set up. We can make some space up here. Let's go ahead and add in the packed move stuff now. We can just go ahead and copy paste that. And you can see this is a lot smaller than our custom save moves. We have we have fewer functions when you override over here, right? But you can see it's similar to the, the original class, where like it's just how we're gonna fill our network data and how we're gonna serialize these variables. And then you can just start tossing in your variables down here to send across to the server. So you can imagine this particular data container, the network move data, is basically some of the stuff you send between client and server. So you kind of want to make sure you send as little data through as possible, just to sort of improve that whole bitrate thing we discussed previously. So yeah, all your special little variables go here, whatever you need. Like I said, I had to add in quite a few extra variables here for Project Next, like gravity direction, rotational information, other little things that are just important to send through to the server every single tick. Uh, so yeah, like I said, it's, if you need more variables, you need them. Like there's, there's no way around it, you know, your game might require them. And that's why this new class is so nice. Because like I said, you weren't able to send this information be through before very easily. And at least not in the manner that allowed you to properly use the backend network prediction stuff. So this is great. So now we can just send whatever variables we need to here. But in a similar fashion to the save move, we also need to tell the system, you know, what, what new move should I be using? You know, what kind of, basically just use my new custom network instead of the parent one. And that's where you do it here. You can see it contains three parameters. And basically the system just set up to have like your new parameters, your pending parameters, and then your old move data, basically. But that's just boilerplate stuff. We'll just, we'll just add that function in. You'll see, you'll see that, you'll see that pop up soon. <laughs> so now we basically declared all the important stuff. But we still got one more thing to do to ensure the system's properly using our new network move data, and that's to go over here to the constructor and start playing around with some of the settings there. But if we're gonna actually use our network data, or our new custom network move data, we're gonna actually have to create a little instance of it, right? So that the class knows what we're talking about. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just, I like doing this little thing where like I create a new section, even though they're both public public, we're gonna have additional protected and private variables along the way, but I just like sort of adding a little section for certain other little sections, so here we are. And you can see we've created our custom move data, a little little instance over here, so we can keep uh, keep track of it. Just declare that, and we also have some additional little functions. So remember we talked about compressed flags. Ah, oh, we don't like I said we don't necessarily need this. We're going to implement it anyway because it's just you know it's it's part of the whole thing. But we're not really using the F save moves get compressed flag system anymore. Or at least not going to be using it properly in this tutorial. But like I said, I'm going to implement it anyway, so you can see like how you'd grab the flags from that old system in case you do want to use those four custom flags uh, for, if you if you want to <laughs> and of course we're going to just set up our prediction data but again just telling the system okay use my new prediction data as opposed to the old one and you, you can see like 90 percent of this is just boilerplate set up that's why like let's get through this quickly shall we <laughs> so i've already gone and i've moved across to the cvp I've included some of this stuff here. You can see I've added in the character just so we can have reference to the character class, uh, the physics volume for like a few little, few little things we're gonna do later. Uh, and of course our custom tutorial character, I should have just made that name a bit smaller. That's a long a mouthful. Anyway, the capsule component. And then some annual network stuff just to just to use something called lifetime replicator props, which if you are unfamiliar with that, it's basically just allowing us to add in some replication values within this component. It's probably a, I can, I can talk for a little bit about the difference between uh, sub-object replication, which will be what's occurring in this component, and then top-line actor replication, uh, especially how it relates to how they've initially set up the press jump and, and crouch. But what effectively happened here is that, uh, well, for a long time, it was a little bit more efficient 
to just replicate top level actors. So you know here if you have components within every actor, such as you know this custom component we've made already, and then you have the top level actor, and it's basically easier for the system to run through all of the actors in a level and then replicate their top level variables than just to go into every single actor and then go into every single component attached to the actor and replicate variables and individual components. But nowadays it's gotten better and I actually prefer just having all of my variables that I need to replicate within the components they belong to because it enables reusability of that component. Because what's happened is that it was, it was kind of unavoidable in this case because the character and the character moon component actually have a circular dependency. You can't attach the character moon component to anything except for a character because the character has a whole ton of co code that sort of interoperates with the character moon component and it also is responsible for replicating certain variables down to our simulated proxies. So you can kind of see why it was maybe unavoidable in this situation because the character obviously is what you're controlling, the top level sort of thing, you, what, what kind of buttons you push, it handles the actions, sends those actions through to the character moving component, it handles those things. So the circular dependency in this case is maybe not too bad. It, it is kind of annoying sometimes, not being able to you know just slap this component onto any actor. I actually, in a different project, went and rewrote this component to work on any arbitrary actor with any arbitrary uh, collision shape, all that kind of stuff, just so that you know you could have this holistic sort of approach to actor physics and this and this and that. But I, I, that was just a very particular project requirement, not necessarily the right or the wrong way to do it, you know. But it just gives you some ideas as to what you can do. Maybe you want to make your own component similar to this but allow it to be attached to any actor change up how the replication works maybe even take all of the network replication code in this component strip it out put it into a whole new component that just handles network replication corrections all that uh, saved moves all those good things but it interoperate uh, it will interoperate with the character moving component something like that. anyway so that, that gives you some ideas of how maybe you can if you were to redo all this stuff right how you'd maybe change that up but like I said, this component in itself right now is excellent. No need to worry about you know changing it up and stuff like that. We're going through why we're doing certain things, but it is kind of what led to this component being so big and feeling so overwhelming initially. But anyway, well, <laughs> let's go back to what we're actually doing here and just getting the character moving component to work with our custom logic, right? Let's get back to it. Oh, we're not using this component at the moment. Let's get rid of that, <laughs> that variable. But you can see now <laughs> with components, to allow components to actually replicate, like I said, you have to just make sure they are replicated by default. Just putting this little thing over here. You can just click replication on in Blueprints, but yeah, in this case, we're just telling it in C++, yes, replicate by default, which we're going to be using a little bit later on to replicate some of our variables down to the simulated proxies. And of course, tell it what network data to container to actually use, which is what we created back over here. <laughs> So there we go, now we're using our new network move data stuff, which means we can start filling in variables, we can start setting stuff across to the network, but all we gotta do still, obviously, is just start <laughs> overriding these guys. Like I said, more boilerplate, nothing too crazy to worry about. All we're gonna be doing is just adding our own little variables and logic in. Like, like a good solid amount of this backend networking stuff is sending through one or two little variables, one little bit flag, one little boolean, one little this, that, you know, kind of thing. So that's why, <laughs> but just a lot of functions to override to get that done. But oh, we're going to get that there. Like I said, boilerplate. You can probably, if, if you're not too interested in the next bits, I'm going to be just discussing obviously more tips and tricks and all that kind of stuff, but you can always skip ahead to where this stuff is all done and we can get into creating the sprint function. But like I said, we're just going to go through a bit more boilerplate right now. But first up, let's do a little bit more housekeeping. Let's just like, you know, make some extra little help of things. So first of all, let's, it's always good practice to create a little cached version of your character, your custom character within your custom moving component. So let's just go ahead and slap it into a protected form over here. You can see, there it is. And of course, if we're going to be doing some casting and whatnot, we're going to probably want to do that on begin play. Let's go ahead and add in the begin play function. And then we might as well just go ahead and just set this up while we're here. And just go ahead and slap that in here, shall we? And bam. See? Super simple. All we're doing is just casting to our special little character over here. And there we are. Our custom character should now be cached and ready to be used in all of our logic. Let's say you have variables like whether you're stunned, this or that, on the character, whatever the case is. Now you can actually just check those variables from that custom class. Or if you have extra little humper function to see whether or not you can sprint, this, this, that. Now you at least have your your reference, which is good practice. Now let's just go ahead and do all of those networking like little overrides, right? All those various functions and whatnot. This is gonna be quite a drop of functionality. 
but we'll go through it. Are you ready for it? All right. Bam. You can see that there's all the functions that we, we were yet to override are now slapped properly in here. Here's our serialized function for the network move data. And if we were to go to the super, you can kind of see how that works. Under serialized optional value. Very simple. Like I said, this is like the standard way of doing it. This is what you're going to be doing for all of your little variables you're adding in as well. It's going to be calling these little serialized optional value things, what current parameter it is, all that kind of stuff, and sending it through. And you can see, actually, we have our move flags and stuff over here, as well as our movement mode, our movement base, all that kind of stuff that's already available, that's already available in the base parent class. But yeah, it's going to be adding our own in. Our client fill network data, and you can imagine this is basically... In a sense, it's like the, the yin-yang, you know, like your one sends, one receives. So you can imagine if you're serialized where you're sending stuff through, you're grabbing the variable, sending them through. You're basically filling a network move data, selecting over here, and you're busy extracting it over here effectively. Basically, you're going to see that a lot. Like that, there's, there's one that fills, or one that sets, one that grabs, one that sends, all that kind of stuff. Now, what can combine with what we just discussed. Like if we were to go to the super ones again, you can see. Basically, if... Nothing in the two moves has changed. You can see you have to. This is this is a, this is a really tedious function, by the way. It compares like uh, whether or not the new move's acceleration is different. If the if like if you were jumping before, but you are jumping now, then obviously you can't combine moves because they're not they're, they're different. Basically, so long as you can have to check through all of your stuff, you have to be like, okay, if I'm sprinting now and was not sprinting before, therefore this is a fresh move. It's got different information. Don't combine. But if this move and the previous move are exactly the same, none of this information has changed then it is a candidate for becoming a combined move. Just slap them together, basically just like make them one. Then you have less stuff to send to the server, all that kind of stuff. Improves network efficiency. Once again, this is more of an optimization function this can combine with. But it's important to have, as mentioned, because you know, it just improves your game overall. You could just make sure it never combines, but then that's a bad idea, you know? You're going to lose some efficiency there. So just, like I said, this is this is probably one of the more tedious ones you have to just constantly do stuff with. But like I said, there's a pattern to it, right? Like you're gonna, we're going to get into that soon. Set move four, super simple. Just set up the move before you start doing stuff. You can see here, just setting up all these variables from the character. Like in this case, it's grabbing a lot of information from the character. Because remember the character, like I said, has that circular dependency. So it grabs a lot of information there. Make sure it's locally cached variables are set up and ready to go. Get all the information from that. But importantly, what we're doing is we're actually filling in variables on the save move because these are stored on the save move themselves. Remember, these are the cache versions on the save move, but these also exist often within the character moving component itself, or in this case, these actually exist on the character. But like I said, these variables, we're gonna actually be storing them in the component instead, because like I said, I like to encapsulate things just within the component. But yeah, so you can see why these exist in the character, but they also exist in the saved move, because these are the saved moved cached versions of what the character did in that particular tick, right? That's all we're doing there, is just setting that up making sure that's set up nicely. But we are gonna make things easier on ourselves by actually calling these saved, having a little saved marker in the name somewhere so you know which particular variable you're working with. Because imagine if you have a B wants to crouch in the save move and also a B wants to crouch in the component or on the character and stuff like that, because then you can be confused as which is which. So we're gonna be just changing up the naming structure a little bit there on our side. Prep move forward, like this is, we've been through this. This is basically allowing you to just set up your component in that instance to have the same logic or rather the same parameters as a previously played move. Because remember, this is now move replaying. Prep move four is typically for when you're replaying a move after a correction, right? So you can see that happening over here where you're actually setting up your character's information. In this case, like I said, these variables will be stored in our component, but in this case, they're on the character. And it's busy setting itself up to be the same value as what exists on that particular saved move. So that's what we're doing, right? It's like saying, okay, for this, when I'm when replaying this move for this tick, just set up the all the variables to be the same as the, the current save move that we're trying to replay, and then boom, replay the move, stuff like that. So not too bad, right? Like I said, that's just move replaying stuff I'm basically doing there. And here's a little setup part for the prediction, just telling it, oh, this is what we're gonna be using instead. This like this this is pure boilerplate, this stuff. This like there's not there's not typically you don't do much more than this. <laughs> I can't I've never actually done more than what this this is this boilerplate stuff, just to make sure your client prediction data is the same as your updated version that you put up, your custom version. Clear, self-explanatory, right? Like I mean, don't even really go through this, but you can see it's just resetting everything to false, resetting everything to zero, just making sure a move 
is fresh again, just completely clearing out so that you, so that it can be reused. Because basically, you know, if you're going to allocate memory and all that kind of stuff, if a, if a save move is done, you might as well just clear out the stuff, use it again kind of thing. So that's basically all it says. Compressed flags. Okay, get compressed flags we discussed already. It's just grabbing the compressed flags that we talked about before, but we're not going to actually use those, these fellas over here, because of the restrictions we talked about before. And we're not going to be using their custom flags either. So we don't have to worry about that too much. But like I said, I included it here because that's just good practice. That's typically what you use when you're using, working with the save move stuff. But in this case, nah, not going to be using it. Uh, here's our, there you go, this constructor is just there. <laughs> so we can skip this one, basically. <laughs> of course, allocate new move. We discussed that previously. That's just telling us, oh, instead of using the, the old move, you know, our parent one, let's use our new one. Like I said, boilerplate, normal stuff. Once again, more boilerplate. That part about the three parameters, you can see them over here. The new move data, the pending move data, and the old move data, which we talked about over here. And like I said, in a sense, this is a mirror of allocate new move almost, because it's just telling that, oh, hey, here's the new data you're going to be using instead of the parent data. Here's your custom data, our custom move data, as I said earlier. Over here, and remember, these are all happening in their respective places. Like, this is the network move data container, right? And with all the other stuff to do with the save moves, they're doing stuff within the saved move. Sorry, I forgot to point that out, that not all of this is happening within the component itself. These are these are the functions that were stored within the custom move over here and within the custom network move data. But now when we jump across this last one, update from compressed flags, that's obviously a part of our main custom moving component because it has to grab those things from the from the from the save moves or something at some point, right? <laughs> and that's basically what that function does. And once again. Oh, it wants us to go to the correct one, but like you can see how it did it previously, it just <laughs> does all the stuff that would do with jumping, updates itself based on the current flag, whether or not the jump was pressed at that time from when you receive that information from a client, all that kind of stuff. But we're not going to be using this too much. Well, actually, we're not going to be using this function at all. I just included it once again, just for just for historical value, I guess. <laughs> and once again, if you want to just use those four extra custom flags that are that are pretty useless. <laughs> anyway, that's like the basic setup. So now you can see, all we're gonna be doing is just filling in our serialized information for each individual indiv variable that we add in. We're gonna be doing the can combine with for them, set move four, prep move four. Um, but importantly, what's gonna be happening is, you can imagine that if we have, let's say, let's take the B wants to jump, for example, right? We're gonna have a B wants to jump stored locally, because remember, it's stored over here in the character, right? We can see that with the B press jump over here with the update from compressed flags thing. And you can see it's called B press jump. And here we have B wants to crouch. It's kind of like a discrepancy there in like the, the pattern of how things were named, but it's fine. We're going to be changing that. But somewhat importantly, you can kind of see that these things are like hinting, like the player intends to do something. The player requests something. That whole player intent thing I keep yammering on and on about. That's basically what this says, right? Like they, they press jump. But do they, are you going to let them jump? I don't know. You Maybe you're not going to. If they, they want to crouch, but are you going to let them? No, there might be something that blocks that ability, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's why we have like that, that, like that once to is an important thing, just player intent. So we're going to be doing that kind of stuff in our end, right? Like I said, all we're doing is setting through a couple of these little bits and bobs through and, and then like getting information out of those. So it seems like a lot of work to send through a few little bits and bobs, right? Like a couple of little boolean little flags and whatnot, but like it's important in the end and like this is this is what we have, you know? This is all we got. So we've got to just follow the little pattern over here. And it all makes sense in the end. Like these these they, all these functions are kind of going to be there no matter how you set this up, if you think about it. You're always going to be sending stuff, receiving stuff. And in this case, in the character move component, it's nicely optimized and done for us. So we just follow their rules. We've got to. We've got to follow their rules to make our games. And moving on, this is a boilerplate thing, like I said. Don't even have to worry about doing anything more on this. Very nice. Clear. Yeah, you can just go ahead and all the variables that you have in your custom save move. Let's say if we add a B once to sprint once again, you can set that to false here just to clear it out. I mean, a boolean doesn't really matter that much, but like saying it to false is good. And once again, compressed flags. We're not going to actually be touching this whatsoever. It's just here for historical information for historical reasons. <laughs> like I said, this is set left empty. Allocate new move. Also done. Boilerplate done. So, in reality, we already have a couple of things. We can basically, in fact, we might as well just swap places a little bit here. Because, put the clear up here. Because these, 
These are all done. I'm not touching these in the future. That's just our little boilerplate stuff. You can just set and forget, as they say. But this stuff, we're going to be using over and over again. And luckily, like you see, look at that. Not too much, right? Just a couple of little things to fill in. So let's get going with uh, our first little line of business, I guess. is like, well, now that we've got all of this set up, all this work, all this boilerplate, what do we want to do? Well, we want to make a game, right? We want to make a game that's networked. We want to get the multiplayer working. And we want them to be able to, I don't know, sprint, fly, all that kind of good stuff. So let's go ahead and start setting that up, huh? Oh, quick little insert here. This is why it's important to always, you know, compile your project as you code and stuff so make sure everything's working properly. But uh, you might get a little area if you try and like uh, compile it if you've been following along word for word. <laughs> All you gotta do is just make sure that this here little constructor matches with what is available over here in the parent character. As well as in its CPP. Add in the little object initializer parameter. That's the little thing there. If, you, if your project's busy failing to compile, that's probably it. And the error message might be a little bit skipped, uh, a little bit lacking in details. <laughs> so here we are. We've just finished all of the boilerplate for setting things up. It's all empty and ready for us to start adding stuff into. And now we can start thinking about what do we want to add in our game. And now you're probably seeing that like, oh, what kind of game do I want to make? What do I want to add? And I think one of the more common things that most people want to do is just add a sprint function, right? You want to be able to push left shift or whatever the case is and you want the character then start sprinting get a little higher movement speed but in this remember remember the whole thing right that we've always talked about is that you start with the play intent or the input that goes and you get an acceleration and all that kind of stuff but in this case in network you think about play intent will lead to the activation of something potentially if it's allowed to so let's just think about like that is let's say entering a movement mode whatever the case is and then it can go from there so all we're really trying to do is to say, here's an input. We want to activate some kind of variable. And then we want to have some kind of like result from that that leads to changes in velocity and then go through our movement mode and all that kind of good stuff. Right? I think perhaps putting the movement mode there was a bit of the incorrect thing to say. But think of it as you're activating a state. And in this case, a movement mode is a state of motion or a state in which you can actually move around the environment. Right? So I'm going to just dump a bunch of variables here, and we'll go through why they exist. So first of all, our intent. So B wants to sprint. This is like our B wants to jump, or in this case, you know, the B press jump, even though now all of our things that indicate player intent is going to be wants to. Trust me, pick, pick a particular naming convention and stick to it. In this case, all of our player intent variables are wants to, and then we're going to get through to something called like the actual state. So if we want to sprint and the system says you can sprint then obviously enter sprinting but pay attention here to the actual u property descriptors over here we're allowing blueprints to obviously work with them all that kind of stuff but our is sprinting is replicated and now this is important sometimes you can get away with not sending something or not replicating something because the, the clients or the, the simulated proxies can sort of infer information they can be like oh i'm running at this speed now because that is already networked therefore i must be sprinting but in a lot of cases, in this case, that could be incorrect. I mean, you could be getting a little speed boost. doesn't mean you're sprinting. And this is sprinting variable. It could be triggering a bunch of other little effects and animations and all that kind of stuff. So it's important in this case to at least replicate this particular variable through to simulate a proxy. So that's why this is replicated. And we move along. Uh, we have a custom max speed. So now we can just change up what our sprint speed is, right? And basically, just, that's just... Let's, just, let's set... But actually, because I think the default's 500. So let's go ahead and make this something like... Something dramatic, like a thousand, right? Set that up already. <laughs> but nice thing is that we've set this up to work in blueprints, right? So when we create our little character blueprint, we can just change that up before we play. So whatever you set as a default here won't matter too much because we can always change it in the blueprints later, you know? So let's just say a thousand for now. And importantly, this little function down here is our first constraint on player intent, right? Because remember, the player is requesting to enter sprint. They're not saying set my movement speed to this particular speed. They're saying I want to sprint. And if the actual moving component says, okay, yes, I agree with you via can sprint, then it will set B a sprinting to true. And then that can start triggering stuff for us, right? And importantly, that's what this allows the player from potentially cheating. Because the only information we're getting from the character and understanding or rather acting on from the character is a request, which means this is considered to be something called a safe variable. Now, that's something you might have heard from in uh, dull goodies tutorials is the safe and unsafe variables. So basically, if you're sending through a value like custom max speed and expecting the 
the component just to set that, that's an unsafe variable. Someone can use that to cheat. But if all you're sending through are requests, then you're good to go because that means the component or actually rather the server is always gonna be in control of that. If we move down a bit, you can see I've already added in two extra overrides for get max speed because remember, all of our various movement functions like flying, walking, falling, they all have their own movement speeds, right? So basically what we want to do when we're adding in sprinting is to actually override this so that we can say, okay, if I am sprinting, obviously use my custom sprint speed instead of my usual speed. And in this case, we only have one sprint speed. So if you want individual sprint speeds for flying, swimming this, obviously you probably would want that. You can add that in. But in this particular tutorial, we're just gonna be going for one value just for simplicity's sake. But yeah, get max speed, like we've mentioned before, it's weird to that. If you wanna do stuff with acceleration, you're gonna to wanna to change up your get max acceleration function. So like I said, like the, from here on out, like the world's your oyster. Whatever you see in here, you can change up, you can add stuff, you can override the existing functions to add in your own functionality. That's all that we're doing here, right? And therefore that'll all work properly with the existing content. This saves us time. We're not gonna go ahead and create a whole movement mode just for sprinting. That'll be, you know, a bit silly. We're gonna do that a little bit later on with wall running because that is a whole new custom simulation that doesn't necessarily act in the same way as our existing movement modes. But in case of sprinting, we're gonna just be using that walking movement mode, right? And just changing the speed because everything else should stay the same. There's no other real extra parameters. Of course, if you need some stuff to change there, then you can just go ahead and add in a sprinting movement mode with additional functionality, all that kind of stuff. But usually you can just get away with reusing what's there. So just keep that in mind. In this case, we're not creating a new movement mode. We're just creating one new variable. So you can imagine like, is sprinting, is the state that we are entering which just modifies our movement speed, which then modifies, I guess, a well, slightly modifies our walking movement mode. Because all it's doing is changing the speed. So that's just nice that if you can think about the simplest way to do something, then you don't even have to worry about networking certain functions. Like for example, consider the fact we're gonna be networking this particular Boolean here, right? Which means we're gonna, it's already in our network prediction loop, all that kind of stuff. What can we infer from sprinting? You can imagine a lot of games do a lot of extra functionality when you start sprinting. Maybe you automatically parkour over objects. Maybe when, while you're sprinting, if you're near a ledge, you start where you immediately jump over that particular ledge or over a particular thing, right? Or if you are already sprinting, you can enter wall running. So you can see just by using one networked little variable, you can get a lot of player intent from that, or you can infer player intent then based on what's going on in the environment as well as what input the player has selected. Because remember, inherently, we have very, well, we don't have a huge amount of inputs to offer, especially on like an analog controller or something, right? I mean, you can double click things, you can push certain things in, all that kind of stuff. So that's why it's sometimes good to double up functionality and not only infer things from player input, but also from what's going on in the environment. But anyway, that's just a little extra, little bit of, a little tidbit of information there about what you can do with just one extra little, or just one little, networked variable <laughs> and moving on if you remember from the previous video where we discussed the update character state before moon remember those little those little functions i showed you in perform movement that occurred before you started physics and after well we're going to actually be using one of those right now to help us with setting up sprinting so you can see where all these things start coming in and why that can be so useful you don't have to worry about overriding that whole perform movement function you can just quickly insert a little bit of information right before you start the simulation in this case, checking if you're sprinting and then of course changing your movement speed before you simulate move walking. How great's that, right? Oh, one little thing we forgot to do is just add in our lifetime replicated props because we do have a replicated variable. And you know what, let's actually just deepen this up. We've already started a section over here for our overridden functions. So let's just move them across, shall we? And bam, a little bit neater already. So now that we've organized all of that, Let's go ahead and just implement these functions that we've overridden over here to basically get the functionality working off the bat, right? Let's make sure that we can sprint. Let's add in all that stuff. Let's send a copy pasta over here. And uh, just ignore this code. I just, I just commented it out so that I don't forget to add it back in later. <laughs> so uh, you can see here, basically get max speed. It just says now, like if we are sprinting, then use our custom max speed, which will be our sprint speed of a thousand now, right? Otherwise, use our parents get max speed. Because obviously if you're not sprinting, just use the normal one, which is what we've been through before, right? That has all the different movement modes of speeds in them. 
So basically we're saying like, if you're sprinting, ignore the other move speeds and just use our maximum sprinting speed. Can sprint, pretty much the only constraint we're applying over here is to make sure that they are moving on the ground, they still exist, and of course that they still want to sprint. And if all those conditions are meant to double check to see, okay, what's my velocity, which move direction is my forward direction, and then check to see, so long as you're more or less moving forward, you can change this value up, therefore like then allow that character to sprint. But if they're not moving forward, do not sprint. So there's our little constraint, right? That prevents players from sprinting left, right, wherever they want to do. And also all that kind of stuff. They're not trying to sprint in any other, any other way. <laughs> And down here, I've just interwoven our lifetime replicator props function. If you've never seen this function before, this is just the standard replication function used for when, well, whenever you have a replicated property. And you can see here, we've made a little condition that says like only simulate or well, only replicate down to simulated proxies, right? Because our local client will already know that we are sprinting or not because the server will also tell us and also the server will dictate to us whether or not we're sprinting. So we're not too interested. Let's just save some, let's just save it from being sent to you for no good reason, basically. <laughs> and of course, our favorite little state to active updates character state before movement. And here we're going to check to see, once again, we don't need to run this on the simulated proxy because we are going to be sending to that to them via this condition over here. And in fact, we can go one step further on the simulated proxy and see that if we did run this logic, it would crap out because our B wants to sprint is not networked to simulated proxies. Only the autonomous proxy, you, and the server care about B wants to sprint. The autonomous proxy, I mean, the simulated proxy does not care at all. <laughs> so that's important to keep in mind there. And that's why we, we double checked. You know, don't, don't, don't run this unnecessary code on the simulated proxy because also it's going to it's gonna get incorrect results then. <laughs> so I'll just yeah send the, the authoritative server stuff through to the simulated proxies instead, instead of allowing it to infer that information in this particular situation. There are other situations where you can infer a state based on what's coming through from the server without you having to replicate something. But in this case, we'll just replicate this variable basically. <laughs> and bam, we're, we're done adding in sprinting because all we're doing with sprinting, remember, is just changing the max speed and double checking that we can sprint our first little constraint on player intent right and then we're just making sure that this that particular is sprinting property is sent through the simulator proxy so that you can make sure the animations sync up or whatever other effects you have going on with this variable because you can imagine this variable right here can be very useful to a, like a large number of systems maybe a little vfx effect maybe like i said the animation state indefinitely as well all that kind of good stuff so yeah and then of course we're just updating the state we're actually making sure that we are checking the state at some point before we simulate the move, right? Before we run the physics function. And boom, that's it, that's that's sprinting done. Like sprinting's pretty simple to add in, right? I mean, it looks like a lot, but it's actually not that much at all. The part that we need to now worry about only is that, is this networked right now? And the answer is a definitive no. But luckily, all that we need to get this up and running and networked is one little variable, right? B wants to sprint. Everything else is being checked by the server to double check things, right? I mean, you could be lying about if you're on the ground or this or that. Your movement mode state could be different on your end than on the server end. Because like I said, maybe you walked off a cliff or ran into a box that knocked you up in the air. Or I don't know, you entered a launch pad that didn't happen on the server side or something like that. So it needs to double check that you're still moving on the ground and all that kind of stuff and that you still exist. Of course, if you had a, a shooter type game and this and that, you'd probably add in like is your character dead here? You know, that kind of stuff. You double check that in case like you were already dead on the server side, so therefore you can't sprint. But I suppose that becomes more pertinent when you want to dash or something, something a bit more elaborate. But still, this allows the server now to control you on its end without you sending bad information through because all you're sending through is your intent. So yeah, once again, all we're doing is sending one little variable through, right? So let's go and actually add that into our network prediction loop. And this is the fun part. Okay, it's not that fun necessarily, but this is the cool part is that it's just a quick little pattern. Like it's a constant little pattern because here we have B wants to sprint, right? We're going to obviously just need to store that information in our save move, like how the parent does it, right? Because remember, the parent even keeps track of whether you press jump, whether you wanted to crouch for that particular move, right? So we need to store it there too. So let's go ahead and create our first official variable. We can even add a little part here that says variables. And of course, we're adding the little marker called save just to <laughs> help with our sanity. Just to remember which which particular variable we're working with. Because remember, we're going to be working with three different things here, right? Because obviously, we want to save. We'll have a save variable for move replaying. But of course, we also want to make sure this variable is network. We actually want to send this through to the server, right? So therefore, we come up here to our packed movement, or rather, our network move data. 
and once again we can add a little variables oh never mind i've already got a variable section down here whatever works for you you can put it wherever you want to <laughs> and we want to change this though to say b wants to sprint move data so that we know which thing we're working with once again and there we go so now you can, remember what i said previously right is that sending through a boolean isn't necessarily super network efficient but that just depends on you and your project needs we're going to be going over the bit flag approach later on when we introduce flying so you can choose which method you want to do it just depends entirely on on you you know your project something like that so this is less efficient to just send through a full-on boolean like i said it depends on you but like this is just showing you how it works and how you can send through basically any variables you want to the server now depending on what how you want to simulate your particular state but after doing that, you can start seeing the pattern emerging, right? You basically, whatever the client does, you want that action to, of course, be recorded here in your character movement component, your once to sprint, the play intent. And of course, you want that information to be saved in the uh, custom move for move replaying if the server disagrees at some point. And we want that particular play intent to be sent through to the server as well. So there's the little pattern, right? So simple enough. And that's, that's all you need to do right now in the header to get the sprinting sorted out which means we can now move on to the actual CPP and start doing stuff there. But on that note, I did forget one little important function, which we can just slide in over here, which is move autonomous. This is actually where you unpack information from your packed movement, from your little dart you're sending through over here. So sorry about that, but let's, let's just add that in quickly. We'll just put it right on here, serialize because basically it is receiving the information that comes from serialize, right? And you can see right there, it's from our network move data. We're just checking to see, you know, grabbing it from our little situation and then seeing, making sure it's not actually a null pointer. And then we're going to be setting our B wants to sprint, our local one over here, equal to whatever we're receiving from the current move data, which will be our B wants to sprint move data because now this is coming in right over the network or whatever the case may be before we actually move our autonomous proxy on the server side. So now we're kind of seeing that whole pattern we talked about earlier come into play, right? Because here we're getting the information from the client. We're setting it up. We're playing that move, double checking to make sure that it's actually correct, sending a correction if it's not. And if there's a correction, we're going to be replaying the moves. We're going to be setting the move up, preparing the move for all that kind of good stuff. You know? So you can kind of see that full stack applying over here. But anyway, got one little part of it done. So let's find the rest of them, shall we? And let's start off with our other little buddy, our little counterpoint over here, the serialize. And you're done. We're going to be serializing our B wants to spend move data as a boolean and then sending that through to the server. But like, 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 what, what more do you need, you know? Boom, done. <laughs> Not too bad, right? And if you come over to client fill network move data, all we're going to be doing is just, well, that's it. <laughs> we're going to be setting our move data equal to our current save move. Now you may be wondering, why are we doing stuff with our current save move instead of grabbing it directly from the character movement component? Well, it's just because of where this is used and the relevancy to both the client and the server. Let's actually just go to our super function over here, right? And you can see that they also do the same thing where they're grabbing stuff from the client move. You're probably wondering, why is this, right? Well, if we actually just go ahead and do a little control F and find little places where this is used, you can see in our function over here, client update position after server update, basically when we receive a correction, obviously we want to grab this information from the current move because we want to replay the move using our move data as well, right? So, and also importantly, if we go a little bit further down, what we're sending through, remember, to the server is our moves and the server will be acting our moves as we go. So over here, when we call server move packed, we're sending it a new move, a pending move and an old move, right? And it's also going to be doing the same thing here where it's filling information from the client and then accessing that. So that's why we do that over there. So why we, that's why we use the saved move. Because remember, our saved moves are our simulation state for that particular timestamp for that particular tick. So that's why we do that here. And I can move on to can combine with this. this is our, like I said, this is the tedious part. Every single little variable you add in here, you're going to have to just add to the can combine with. I suppose in a sense, if that's tedious, the rest is tedious. But basically, you can see the pattern emerging here. I just... <laughs> I don't know why I find this part tedious, but it, it is. <laughs> so yeah, what we're gonna do over here is just plonk in with a knot. Our current once a sprint is different to the, well, sorry, our previous move is different to our new move and stuff like that. So they can either combine the move or not. And therefore, like if they are not the same, we're gonna return false, do not combine with. 
Otherwise, we're going to defer back to our parent, which will then, of course, do all of its little checks over here, which are very similar. Basically, like, you know, are you sprinting, are you not? Sorry, not sprinting. <laughs> are the timestamps the same? Were you jumping? All this kind of stuff, right? Not too bad, not too bad. But, like, you can really start seeing this little pattern. Like I said, it's just one big pattern. So once you've got the first variable in, in all of these, you can just keep following the same pattern over and over again whenever you add a new variable. Simple enough, right? So let's move on to the, the next little use case. So this is where we set our move up, right? This is where we can populate our actual move that we create. In this case, what, what we have in our what, what, what new info do we have is just our sprint state, right? Our save sprint state, and this is where we can actually set it to equal to our current state. So this is on the client side, obviously, where you're going to set up your current state, which usually is what you do before you send that move through to the server, or I guess use that move for this particular turn, whatever the case may be. But basically, this is the, the client populating its saved move to be used. <laughs> And now kind of like opposite to that is prep move four, which like I said, is more for when you're replaying your move. So in this case, right, all we're gonna be doing is grabbing our character move component and setting that equal to our saved move state. Because remember if you're replaying a move, obviously you're just gonna set up your current variables to be equal to our old variables so that we can re-simulate that state and that move, right? That's all you're doing there. Clear? Okay, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Right? All we're gonna be doing there is just setting this back to zero, setting this back to false. And bam, done. All your little variables that you store in your save move, you just set them back to false, set them to zero, whatever the case may be, and then you're done. And well, actually, more than just done, done, you're, you're done. Wow, look at that. Nice little pattern, right? Look at that, all, all there. No issues, right? You can see it's all it's all happy and dandy. And like, there's the general pattern, like the boom. You've basically just annihilated network prediction, in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> you can sort of extrapolate, you can already take this information and extrapolate on from here and just adding in more variables, doing your own little thing. But we're not, we're not done yet. There's some extra little things to, to think about when you start doing stuff with the movement modes and this and that. But like, then boom, this is your, this is your back end narrow prediction setup, done. How's that? Not bad, huh? I suppose now all that we can really do with this is just test it out, you know, make sure it actually works. We've done all this stuff now. Now we actually want to play our game. I want to see the changes that we've made. So let's just try and run this thing and see if it works. You're going to hit F5. Oh, it's, it's compiling. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> and I'll just skip ahead to when it loads in. And now we're all loaded in. So importantly, we have this blueprint over here, right? And usually, if you just had like a, a C++ standard thing like this, you might just be able to create a new class, be fine and dandy. But this class does have updates to it, does have changes. It's got the, the mesh changes, it's got the custom character movement stuff we've done. So obviously, you want to transfer this. Oops, sorry, minimize that. We're going to want to transfer this across to the new one. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and say duplicate. And let's maybe give it a new name like Tutchar. And now that it's duplicated, we can just hop on in. Let's open up full blueprint. Go to our class settings, and here under parent class, we can just go ahead and say, no, I want to use my custom character instead. And boom, it updated. Seems fine. We hope. <laughs> nah, it should be fine. <laughs> and it's got all of our settings set up already. We've got our mesh already all done. Same animations, same settings. We can even double check that we're saying, oh, yeah, look, all these same things are the same that we changed. And boom, our, our class is updated to use our new tutorial thingy. Well, let's just add in a little hacky thing. Like I said, let's just say left shift. Remember, this is this is not how you would want to do inputs. This is just our, like it even says debug key left press. Let's just like do that. And we want to be able to go ahead and, oh, actually in this case, we want to get custom character movement. Because we have that little function set up, remember, in C++, which will help us out. This little guy over here, which does the cast and everything for us already. And well, what, what you want to do, because this is actually still doing a cast, we should probably actually just go ahead and promote this to a variable on begin play. Let's just, let me just show you the good practice over here. And let's just call this variable our custom uh, CMC. Because this is still doing a cast, right? If you, if you keep calling this over and over again, it's still doing that cast every single time. So let's just rather store our little thing locally and then use that. And one we want to do is when we press the key, we want to set once to sprint to true. So we're flip flopping our local boolean, right? And if we want, and if the thing, if let's, let's do it like an on hold type situation, when they release, we want to stop sprinting. 
And that's that. That's the network setup. Because remember, we've set up the networking already in the back end in C++, right? Because we know that this Boolean is going to be sent through, it's going to be loaded into our packed movement, sent through to the server, and the server will be able to use that information on its end, right? We've already established that. So that means all we need to do on our end locally now, in our blueprint or in your C++ character class, is just flip-flop that Boolean based on player input. And like I said, this is just a, a debug key left shift thingy. You'd want to set that up in the new enhanced movement rather, but this is just for little testing. So now we can go ahead actually, and so now we can set up our little environment over here. So let's go ahead and add three players so that we have one listen server and then two autonomous proxies or two clients that's connected to that server. But before we actually hit play, <laughs> we do have one important thing to do at the moment. It's going to be spawning our old third person character in, right? Because there's a different movement mode, a different game mode rather. So let's just go ahead and add in a new game mode, game mode, bam, bam. We can just actually make a child of our character tutorial game mode. Why not? Why not? Let's just call this BP uh, test game mode, whatever you want to call it, right? If you open this up, we can now change some stuff here. So first up, we're going to change this BP third person over to our tut char. And everything else can stay the same. We haven't changed our... Uh, various controllers or anything like that. So boom, done. We can actually just close that up now. And we can just make sure that we're using our new test game mode over here. Let's save out our level so that next time we come back in here, it's not freaking out. And with that done and our character set up, there is something that I, uh, I made a mistake on over here. Let's just open up our tut character. This debug key doesn't seem to be working in the networked environment. So let's go ahead and do a normal left shift instead, all right? Just go edit that up in your code. And now, we should be happy. One quick little note as well, somehow the footage, it seems like playback in OBS is a little bit laggy or like weird. Let me show you, let me demonstrate. If I was to go now and actually play with this client, well, let's first set up some stuff, right? Let's first just go ahead and add in corrections. You can just say show corrections and it'll pop up with this. Hit the up arrow key to select it and say space one to activate that. And let's add in some client net lag. You can just go net space lag and it'll pop up with the shorthand over here. And let's give ourselves 200 ping. That's a good little amount of ping, right? You're going to see some initial corrections potentially. But it looks like it's happy. So you can see when I chain, turn the camera. I don't think it's doing it now. <laughs> but usually when I turn the camera, some little lagginess happens in, on OBS that doesn't actually exist in the game. So if you're seeing your lagginess on your side, it just may be because of OBS doing some weird stuff. Anyway. Back into this. So now you can see we're playing with 200 ping. And we can guarantee, we can see this by, if, once again, if I move, you can see there's a delay between when I start moving on my side, which I can exaggerate a bit more with, let's go for 500 ping. You might see some corrections initially, but you can see how long it takes for me to start moving on the server side on the top there. But everything else is fine and dandy. And now if I hit left shift, I should speed up. And voila, and I can stop and start sprinting as much as I want. I'm spamming the left shift key. You can probably hear it in the microphone even. <laughs> Loud clicky keyboards. Um, but yeah, I've got 500 ping right now and we're getting no corrections. I can jump, I can do all the stuff that we usually do. But if you run into these boxes, you're gonna get corrections. Oh, there's our first little correction actually. But I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable to get these corrections. Could have been anything that caused that there. But it's not because of our network prediction setup. That's for sure. <laughs> But yeah, you see, that's all working fine. And anyway, our shift is in. And bam, look at that. You've, you've created a shift ability. Oh, sorry, a sprint ability. <laughs> and now if, you've, if you're able to create a, shift, a sprint ability, you can create anything you want using that same setup. Like I said, like all we're going to be doing now is just creating a new movement mode, do some wall running, show some slightly more advanced stuff, discuss bit flags a little bit and why that's a little bit more optimal. Well, we really discussed that, but we're going to be implementing that. And then you're going to see a really nice, easy way to do it so you can have access to it in blueprints and all that good stuff. So bam, there we go. Proof that it works. <laughs> and we can sprint. So now that we know that it's working and our project's compiling, everything's fine and dandy and happy, and we can just activate these things by just flip-flopping some booleans. Isn't that nice? And in the bit flag case, we're going to just be flip-flopping bit flags through some very easy to use uh, blueprint functions. So let's go and just start working on the, let's I guess, the wall running stuff. Yeah, let's go to wall running, huh? So first up, we're gonna be creating a new movement mode, right? Which means we kind of need to add something to what exists already, which we know is, you know, 
walking, nav walking, falling, swimming. And of course, the one we're going to be using over here called custom. But we kind of want to define our own enum with our own types, right? Which luckily, you can. Let's go ahead and just drop it in, shall we? We're going to go just outside of our class here and define our enum right over here. As you can see, I've set it to be a blueprint type. So that means we can access it in blueprint nice and easily. And you always say none initially, and you can always hide it from, you know, from, from blueprint and stuff like that. And then right below it, we have our little wall running movement mode. And that's just step one, defining our movement mode. And this little structure, or this little enum, you can just go ahead and add as many movement modes as you want to, just like start throwing them in. <laughs> but let's go on and add our little variable section. Hmm, where's a good spot? Well, seeing as we have our little printing section over here, let's go ahead and add in our wall running section. And then just prepare yourself. There's going to be a quite a drop of code over here. Woo! Don't we're going to go through it. <laughs> so, of course, what we're going to be checking here is, in a sense, this is our is sprinting. This B wall run is right. Because you can imagine you're going to either be wall running on your right side or on your left side, right? And it just gives us one little variable to track both here and we're actually going to take this little variable right now and slap it into our saved moves. Importantly, we're going to be setting it up so that while we are holding sprint, while we want to sprint, we're going to be checking and allowing ourselves to wall run if the conditions are met. Which means, fundamentally, this is already networked. All we're going to be doing now is just checking to see can we actually wall run and then activating wall run, the wall running movement mode. But we're going to still need to store that information in our saved move because if we replay that move later, we want to know whether or not we were wall running, right? So let's just go ahead and add that up here in saved move. So let's go ahead and just toss it in over here, shall we? Right below our B wants to sprint save, we now have our B wall run is right saved. And once again, we don't need to network this because we're going to be using our sprint data to represent whether or not we want to wall run as well. But we're going to be inferring this from the environmental interaction instead of via player intent necessarily. So let's go back down here. And now pretty simply, right? You want to basically be hitting the wall at a certain minimum threshold. Like what's your minimum speed you can still wall run at? What's the max speed you can run at? Once again, a little max speed, you know? Uh, what's our pull away angle? How attracted are we to the wall? <laughs> um, our minimum wall run height, like how high off the ground should we be when we start wall running? All these things are quite important. And he also, this is by, oh, by the way, this is from Del Goody's tutorial. I requested permission to use this particular example. Uh, I have my own wall run solution in Project Nix, but it's just super like bogged down with additional little checks and systems that are related to Project Nix. So I didn't want to share that because it would basically have to be rewritten and then it wouldn't be as usable. So big thanks to Dalgody for letting me showcase this one, which is like a nice, awesome, clean implementation, uh, which includes this little curve value. Basically, almost like, have you ever played the first Prince of Persia or any Prince of Persia where you start wall running and you go up a little bit, then you go down, you start losing momentum. Effectively, the gravity scale curve is an actual curve you can set up in Unreal to set up exactly how fast or how steadily or whatever the case is, you decline in speed and height and stuff like that on the wall. Uh, we're not gonna be doing that, we're not gonna be implementing this, I'm gonna make it just one linear kind of wall run, but you can always set that up in your project if you wanna play around with that. And you can also go check out, of course, his video to get a much better explanation of how this particular physics simulation works. Uh, I'm more or less just going through how you set up a movement mode and some extra little tips and stuff like that. All right. And of course, how fast we can, or how, how large our jump force is when we jump away from the wall. And then you can add yourself a little like uh, helper function whether or not you are wall running. Of course, you can also just check if you're within a cust certain custom movement mode. Uh, we're gonna be doing stuff when we process landed. This is a little helper things as well to see how big our owner is. So we're going to be grabbing this information from the character. So we're going to be implementing one or two things in the character as well, just to get some general information about the size of their character. Um, and then of course, just like little things when we try to wall run, we're going to be checking to see, can we actually interact with the environment? Are we hitting a wall that we can wall run on? Are we sprinting? Therefore, yes, we can start entering wall run. Then of course, our fizz function, one of the most important things we have, right? Like everything else, you've got the fizz falling, fizz wall running, or sorry, fizz walking, all that kind of stuff. We have our own fizz wall run now. And then I'm gonna introduce you to a little design pattern that I personally like to do. Effectively, whenever you enter or exit a movement mode, you obviously kind of want certain logic to fire or like 
for example when you enter a certain mode maybe you want to turn off collision on some stuff but when you exit that mode obviously you want to clean that up and make sure collision is re-enabled so that's why i like having an entry state and an exit state at all times because remember what's happening in the back end is that it's constantly switching between different movement modes right you're going to be entering walking uh exiting walking entering falling all that kind of stuff and you never know if you want to maybe just have some extra space to put different logic into upon entry and upon exit. So that's why we're going to be introducing these enter and exit functions, as well as implementing them so they can be natively re-implemented in blueprints if you really want to. But we're going to be doing most of our implementation here in C++. But it's just a nice little design pattern to ensure that you always clean up a movement mode once you enter and exit which is something you should maybe get into the habit of doing for a few different systems. Because imagine if you're constantly swapping between states, right? Or even if you are applying and removing status effects, stuff like that, you're going to be having an entry state and on equip, whatever the case is. And also when you remove that status effect, all that kind of stuff. So it's always good to have an entry state and an exit state. Even if you don't really add anything into it, at least it's there for you or designer or someone to add stuff into if they need to. It's just nice to have, it's just good practice. So we're going to be doing that as well, which means we're going to be needing one more little override over here. Because remember, when we enter a movement mode, a certain function fires, and that is called on movement mode. So let's go ahead and add that in here. Oh, actually, it's called on movement mode change, not on movement mode. <laughs> and it is a protected function in the parent, so we're going to be slapping it in the protected section over here. And now that we've got that set up, we have quite a few little things to go and implement. So let's go ahead and just copy pasta some more code, get all of this set up in the CPP. Oh, but before we get across the CPP, I did have to add in some more things. We're going to be overriding some jump logic. Because remember now, we're going to be wall running, right? And we want to be able to jump away from the wall. And currently, how jump setup is that while we're not walking, we can't really jump. But because we're in wall running, we aren't walking. So therefore, we need to make some little updates in here, right? And one more other little thing is that I've now officially added in our three main places to sort of set up your simulation state. Because remember, we had some stuff happening in before in movement, right? Where we set up whether or not we can sprint. And we have after movement, just to do some clean up and stuff like that, whatever happens. Whatever you want to check after your movement has performed, after those physics functions have run their course. And then we have one last little place we can possibly do something before the next tick occurs. So on movement updated, it's kind of a good place to set up stuff for the next tick. Let's say the player pushes a button, does stuff, but you don't want to handle it in that particular tick. You want to defer it for the next tick for whatever reason. You can do it on movement updated, or you can just fully use on movement updated as a place to set up your movement mode changes, this and that, so that it happens at the end of the tick. So you don't have to worry about all the sub ticking changes and that kind of stuff. So those are the various places to do it. But remember, it's up to you whether you want to do stuff before the movement occurs, after it's occurred or at the very last attempt to set up stuff for the next tick. And that's basically the extra little functions we're gonna be handling here. So with that out of the way, now we can officially go into the CPP and let's just go back to up to the top here, right? So what have we done? So remember over here with the get max speed, we added in a new variable for our wall running. So we wanna to check to see if our movement mode is in move custom. Cause now remember with the whole movement thing over here, we're gonna technically be in the custom movement mode we have like a subclass of the custom movement mode which includes our wall running this this that all of our stuff in here so basically we need to check if we're in custom and now we're going to switch on our custom movement mode and boom then we can actually see oh we're now in wall running or this and that therefore return our wall running speed otherwise defer back to sprinting and if we can't if we're not actually in sprinting then of course go back to our super function simple enough Oh, and down here that we can actually go ahead and add this in. We did make B wall run is right a replicated property. If we go back and check that out, which you can see over here. So basically, what it means is it's going to be replicated down to our simulated proxies, very similarly to B is sprinting. We can infer this information. In fact, Doug Billy's example, he does infer this information, this logic from extra little checks on the simulated proxy side. But I decided to bypass that and just sort of replicate it down uh will that in increase network traffic potentially but also then you're not actually running additional code on every single simulated proxy and stuff like that so it's i just decided to set it up as a replicated property just for simplicity's sake now remember our before movement check so basically this happens right before we set up you know that whole start new physics thing where it selects which mode we're in and then runs our physics function in this case it would be if we're in wall running it would switch across to the wall fizz wall running physics mode 
But we're also going to be checking here to see, are we falling? And if we are falling, we're going to try to wall run, which is a whole big little function that just checks to see, are you next to a wall? Are you at the right speed? All those little functions we set up over here, right? All these little variables rather, for whether or not we can actually run along a certain wall, which we'll get into in a second. But of course, there's a little update character state after movement that happens after our physics functions have run, where we talked about before. And then you can see I left it empty. You can always add stuff in here. I didn't really do it for anything. I didn't really didn't add anything in there just yet. We're going to check and see if we are in a custom movement mode and then seeing, okay, yes, are we in a custom movement mode? And what is our current movement mode? Does it basically, once again, we're going to be checking to see our main movement mode is in custom. And then our sub custom movement mode is equal to whatever test we're currently conducting. Now, if we scroll down, we can see Fizz Custom. Because remember now, if we go across back to our the parent character movement component, when we're in Start New Physics, obviously, if we are in Move Custom, we're going to start Fizz Custom. So we've just overridden Fizz Custom now to start using our new wall running movement mode. So you can switch once again. Or just a bunch of switch statements most of the time with this, right? Do a little custom movement modes. And if we are, of course, wall running, do Fizz Wall Run in a very similar fashion to how all the other stuff works. So once again, you can just sort of go back and review how the parent structure works and then sort of follow that pattern in your own work and then you'll you'll probably have some good success. <laughs> now here's that little try wall run function we talked about. And once again, you can you can watch Doug Goody's video on all the different things that goes on here, but you can kind of see that all it's doing is checking the size of the character. Oh, we actually need to go ahead and implement those functions in the character quickly. Uh, let's just quickly do that so that we don't have any errors when we try to compile later. So I just quickly off camera went and added them in. <laughs> You can see I've added in get ignore character parameters. It's nice to have this kind of function here. We probably want to actually set it up to be uh, a virtual function so that we can override it in child class because each child class might want to change up which things are ignored and stuff like that. But at the moment we've got our ignore params and all that does is just set up ourselves to be ignored, all of our child actors attached to us, all that kind of stuff. Just a nice little thing to set up over here, which we call over here in the, in the try wall run function so that we can actually check to see, okay, well, what stuff should we ignore? Obviously, we should ignore ourselves and what, what, and then you can start doing your traces for the wall, checking to see if it's valid, all that good stuff. And then if everything's fine and dandy, we can actually set, we're going to set up our wall running and enter our new movement mode. So here's actually a good place to check to see how you would enter your custom movement mode. You can see you're entering the move custom, but then the extra little subclass of move custom is our move wall running which we'll be checking later on. And it's actually quite a nice structure because you can always just check overall, am I in a custom movement mode? And therefore, how should I differentiate my behavior in this particular case? As you can kind of see over here where I check to see, am I in a custom movement mode? And if so, what is my subgenre of that effectively? <laughs> so it's just nice to have. So therefore you can differentiate and be like, okay, uh, especially if you're doing stuff like you're reusing your movement modes, like in the case of sprinting, you might want to check, okay, am I in a custom mode? Therefore, ignore this particular thing, all that kind of stuff, right? So it's nice to have just like that little extra little thing to check there. But that's how you enter your custom movement mode right here. And now, of course, we get to the fizz, right? The fizz wall running. And you can run through, once again, you can just check Dalgoody's example where he explains all this nice stuff. But you can see how he set up that sub ticking behavior, which is, you know, common across most physics functions, as does all the little things about just teleported. Uh, if something changes, you start new physics mode with the remaining time and iterations. And then from here, you can sort of figure out how it works, whether or not you're pulling away from the angle, if the wall's still valid, whether or not you can actually accumulate velocity at this time, all that kind of good stuff. And then if you look around for that curve value, you'll probably see where the curves here we go, where the curve value starts to allow you to change your velocity down. You can see velocity starts going down so that you start falling off the wall over time, kind of like in Prince of Persia and stuff like that, right? So you can you can just follow along there. But that's, you, if you know how the fizz walking and stuff works, you can kind of figure out how the fizz wall run will work as well. It's just, from there on, it's just your mathematics, right? Like whatever you're setting up in your particular environment, what you want the system to do, this is where your creativity and your, I guess your brain comes into it. <laughs> so you can create your own custom movement modes and how your character interacts with the environment in the way you want in that particular movement mode. Like if you were doing a slide, you wanna to check to see, am I on a hill? And if I'm going down the hill via a few checks, therefore I should start accelerating. But if I'm trying to slide up a hill, obviously we wanna start slowing down until eventually we break once we hit a certain threshold. So you can kind of see how your maths can start coming in here so, but like the structure is kind of the most important thing to keep in mind when you're creating your custom movement modes, right? So that's why it's nice to have this here for you to just check out 
see how it should be done. And then of course you also have all the parent functions to go through as well, if you wanna get some additional information. And remember, you can steal a lot of code from these parent functions. Like you can create, like if you think about sliding, all you're changing unnecessarily is acceleration values and velocity and stuff like that. And doing like little checks to see, oh, if I've slowed down enough, exit fizz sliding and enter uh, fizz walking or fizz whatever. If I'm falling off a cliff, enter fizz falling, you know? So it's, there's a lot of little functionality here you can use. And like, for example, with Project Nix, I kind of just stole a bunch of code from fizz uh, flying to allow you to do extra little things and adhere to the wall and go around bumps and things like that. Just like extra little like nice usability things. Like I said, most of it's stolen from fizz walking, fizz flying, and then some additional custom logic I put together. So like I said, these, these variant functions, they're excellent. It's so nice to have. Go steal what you need to, put it into your game and have a great time. <laughs> And that's how that first function works here. <laughs> and once again, we have that enter and exit thing I talked about with that design pattern. And we can really start seeing that over here. So when you change your movement modes, when you say enter movement modes, like we did over here with the try, when you set your movement modes, basically you're gonna be entering a new movement mode. It's gonna do a bunch of logic, and then it's gonna trigger this function here on movement mode change, which is a really good spot, my favorite place to go and do all those little cleanup checks, right? Like you can see over here, if my previous move mode was move custom, then obviously we want to check if our previous move mode was wall running, and then we want to exit wall run. When we get to the flying implementation, you can see now if we're not in custom, obviously we're in our normal move modes. Therefore, switch to see, okay, if, I've, if I was flying, exit flying. Same thing when we enter. So we do exit first, because obviously you want to exit all of your conditions first and change our parameters before you enter a new mode. Because remember, if you are removing collision before you enter something else or you want to add collision back into before you start entering stuff that could have an effect it could, it, could, it could potentially have a little race condition effectively that's why it's good to exit things first before you enter new ones right so that's why we have it set up like this and of course on entry self-explanatory right so now we can always add in like let's say if you've you can actually maybe even add in a broadcast event here a, a delegate to say okay I've now entered wall run, fire this off, let the, the system know, and then something else can bind to that and you can do some stuff there, or you can play a, 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 like a special kind of VFX when you enter it, all that kind of stuff, right? Simple enough, simple enough. But anyway, it's just a nice place, like I said, it's mostly just to change your parameters and your simulation state when you enter and exit certain modes, in case you need to. Uh, one good example of this is, for example, if you are entering a parkour movement mode, which would then turn off your collision because you don't want to collide with stuff while your root motion task is in operation. You'd obviously, on entry, remove your collision. And obviously, if you ever swap into any other movement mode, as soon as it changes to walking or falling or flying or whatever the case may be, you want to clean that up. And therefore, exit will always run over here before you start going into your new modes and then continuing your simulation because you don't want your character to fall through the floor, right? By having no collision whatsoever. So. If you're entering a state, clean up your parameters. So that's why it's good to follow this kind of uh, design pattern, at least in my belief. Ah, so now we've yammered yeah, on about that for a bit. Let's continue on to our jumps. Once again, we can just see, you know, are we jumping? Are we wall running? If so, you know, we can jump. Because remember, a can I jump jump? We'll be checking to see if we are on the ground. And in this case, we're not going to be on the ground. We're technically on a wall, you know? <laughs> so therefore, if we're on a wall, then they allow you to do do jump. So basically, can tip jumps is run to see if you can do jump. And do jump is where you actually accumulate your velocity upwards. And in this case, if we are wall running, we're gonna be doing some extra logic over here where we just move away, we jump away from the wall at our wall run jump force that we talked about before. Nice and simple, right? So there you go. You can see how you can override these parent functions just to add in your own logic. Like everything is kind of, like I said, most things are here for you you like i said you can whatever you is not available you can likely steal from other sources and just add your custom logic in to fix it up but a lot of stuff is really here and also there's a lot of room for you just add in your own custom logic entirely like everything's kind of you know set up so that you can change it up you can even change up how the networking potentially works stuff like that it's all it's all there for you just to like play around with do whatever you need to do whatever your project requirements are but of course if we keep on scrolling we're going to notice hold on we still have to do our housekeeping here with the network prediction loop, right? But we know that we didn't send anything through to the server on this particular in this particular case because we inferred logic based on what already exists via our sprint boolean, right? 
So therefore, all we need to worry about is just setting up stuff for our custom save move. So let's go into our CPP. So remember, we don't just serialize anything because we're not sending anything through. We don't have to worry about changing anything in move autonomous because we're not actually grabbing data from our move data. But we are going to be checking to see whether or not we can combine two moves together. And therefore, like if our wall run set has changed, do not combine. We're going to be setting the move for once again. Basically, you can see wherever the custom save move comes in, be changing stuff then. Once again, the pattern comes in, right? You can just see if this is an existing example, you can just take that existing example and apply it to all of your new variables. So you can see that we just check to see, we just set up our wall run over here. Then we do the opposite direction where we grab our wall run, our save wall run, and set it equal to our current simulation state over there. We clear it out and bam, that's done. There's your never prediction loop done in this state. So rather our save move setup is done over here, which means we're basically ready to test this out. So let's go ahead and start up the project, shall we? I'll skip ahead to that. All right, and now we're back in. I've already activated the corrections and I've also added 500 ping, which you can see if I come in here and I move. You can see the delay on the server side as well as the other simulated proxy. So I've got 500 ping and corrections are enabled. So let's go ahead and start sprinting. We can see sprinting is still working fine and dandy. But now we don't have to do anything in our blueprint, remember, because our sprint functions are already set up to activate wall running, right? Let's go ahead and see if it's actually working. So let's go right up to a wall and Bam, we're actually wall running. And once again, if we look away from the wall, we'll stop wall running. If we pull away from it based on our little parameters we've added in. We can also wall jump. And remember, this is fire under ping. We're getting no corrections. Everything's working fine and dandy. We're entering and exiting movement modes, having the movement modes transition back into the normal movement modes, all that good stuff. But we can see corrections are enabled if I actually run into a box that isn't networked, right? So you see corrections are actually enabled. And everything's working fine. We can do some pretty elaborate stuff. That's It's a pretty elaborate movement mode that we've added in, right? Like it's something entirely out there that's not available in the base engine. We're not just sprinting anymore. We're now doing a whole new movement mode. And boom, working just fine with fire under ping. So I guess the only thing left to really talk about now is just how to optimize your variables. And in this case, we're going to be looking at bit flags and allowing you to enter the flying moon mode. Because remember, we're not going to allow you, in the blueprint, we're not going to go into the blueprint and say, change movement mode to flying. We're going to request to enter flying, like we did before with sprinting, via Boolean, or in this case, we're going to be using bit flags. So let's go ahead and start adding that into the code once more. And this is the last thing, and then we're done. And we can talk about what's going to happen in episode three. <laughs> so we're back in our movement component uh, header file over here. I'm just going to go ahead and copy pasta this little thing we're going to be using and now this as you can see is set up to be a blueprint type but also with, with the meta tag being bit flags and i'm going to drop a video below you'll see it in the description below like a little video on how bit flags work and why they're done a certain way and why they're optimized but effectively we're going to be chopping up one variable of size eight bits a byte into eight different well eight potential different variables right and we're going to send over the network, which is a lot more network efficient than sending over a bunch of Booleans. But like I said, it depends on your project. You might prefer the Boolean approach for simplicity. But if you are just willing to do a little bit of extra work, you can probably fit a whole bunch of Booleans into these bit flag representations. And then when you receive the bit flags, you can then update Booleans on the server and client side. So you can still work with Booleans in the end. This is a nice network efficient way of handling the transfer of your flags or your your pseudo bulls, whatever the case is. So here you can see what we've done. We've already said, uh, here's one for wants to fly in a very similar way to our B wants to spin, except now it's represented by a bit flag in the same way that the original character movement component sets up their stuff. But you can see I've changed the representation over here. You can see them setting up the bit flags. This is like the more common usual approach. I used a slightly, well, I don't want to say newer, or like I just prefer this way where you can do little bit shifting because you can have zero, one, two, three, whatever the case is, instead of having to do this whole other little weird counting thing over here, even though they're, they're very similar. Let's be serious. It's not, it's not that difficult once you get the hang of it, but it's just nice and neat, this little representation over here. That's why I've just included that way of doing it. And you can see I've set up some other little flags. And obviously, if you were setting this up, you'd want to change this name so it's easier to actually get them right. So if you wanted to add in another one where you enter some other mode, you'd say C flag, that fling. Or you would just, you didn't even have to say C flag. You can name whatever you want to name it. Just kept it there, C flag for now. But yeah, that's how we're going to be setting ourselves across. So now we've got this movement flag. It's also a blueprint type. So it's blueprint interactive, which is really nice. And of course, once we've got this 
there, what do we need to do? Well, we need to add in a variable, a local variable in our custom carriage moving component. We need to add in a saved version of it in our custom saved moves. And we also need to set up our transfer of this information, right? And then on the networking prediction backend, we just have to receive all that stuff. So let's go ahead and add in that little variable. I'm gonna put it right at the top here, just above sprinting. Let's go ahead and make a little section here called bit flags, why not? Hey, don't do that. There we go. So here you can see, and pay attention to the uh, the view property descriptors over here. We can see that we've set it up to be a bit mask, but specifically a bit mask enum that represents our e movement flag that we have over here. This is just some blueprint related stuff, but I thought it would be really nice to show bit flags in a way that is blueprint interactive. Well, like I said, you can grab this information when it's received from the server, from the packed move, and split it up into booleans. So you can you can have a whole bunch of, a bunch of different booleans, B wants to, instead of having this flag, you can have B wants to fly actually be a boolean here. And all you do is you just update that boolean based on whether or not a flag is active when we receive our custom flags. Um, I'll show you where to do that and explain it a bit better when we get to the actual code implementation, but in this particular example here, I'm going to be just working with flags just to show you how you can work with flags and how it can become beautiful and interactive. Because I thought it was actually, like it's not something you see very often and I thought it'd be nice to show. So once again, you can see I've got some little helper functions here, such as is the flag active? And then a whole bunch of like little boilerplate stuff to tell you what kind of flag is coming in and whether or not, and then also like a little operator on how the thing detects whether or not a flag is active. It, you, you could probably Google, like I said, that video that I should describe below or send below to give you some more information on where to go to grab what these various operators mean and all that kind of stuff. Basically just the presence and absence of a certain bit flag. But yeah, these are just like little helpers. So once again, is a flag active? So that's good for like checking if you're in Blueprint saying, like, oh, is this flag active? Therefore, okay, do this particular function. But if you're using your Boolean approach, obviously you just check the Boolean. But like I said, we're going to just do the flag approach in this one. And of course, activating and clearing flags. Basically, you know, saying, yes, set B wants to sprint to true or false, except we're just using flags instead of the Boolean approach. And boom, that's the setup basically done. All we need to do is just go ahead and add these into the CPP. But before we go and do that, let's just maybe just start thinking about our flying movement mode, right? And well, we already have great examples of how our general pattern works. We want to check, okay, do we want to fly? Therefore, can we fly? You know, uh, get to the actual part where we enter and exit flying in a similar way to how we enter and exit other stuff. <laughs> and you can see I've already added it in down here. So whether or not you are flying, fortunately, when we change movement modes, right? That is also replicated down to simulate a proxy. So they will also receive the on movement updated when they change their movement modes. And we're going to be changing this variable in there. So therefore we don't have to replicate it, which is quite a nice little change. Um, and then of course we're going to have the usual enter and exit and then boom, we're done. And we just have a little helper here called does character want to fly added in just to show you how the is flag active stuff works in C++. And there you can see an example of that, just to have your little helper functions. If someone doesn't want to check if a flag is active, they can just go, does character want to fly? It's kind of redundant, I don't really need this thing here because you already have the is flag active approach. But I wanted to include this just so you can see how you can create additional helper functions if you want to. But let's go ahead and just start adding in all the stuff we need to here, yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's not too bad. All we're gonna be doing is just saying, it's checking to see if we can fly, enter flying based on our Boolean flags. Oh, sorry, based on our bit flags. <laughs> so let's go across to the CPP now. So here we are done with our little CPP option over here. And remember when we, when we changed mover modes, right? We would do the whole thing where we enter and exit. So once again, we've added back move flying. So we exit flying upon while exiting and then entering. We've gone ahead and added those in upon entering. And what we're doing now is we're actually flip-flopping our Boolean, which will allow us to change, you know, how, what animations we're playing, all that kind of stuff. And because we're doing it here, it means it's automatically replicated down to our simulator proxies as well, which is also why these can be quite nice functions to add. To follow this kind of design pattern where you enter and exit, you can have a lot of extra logic that then gets also replicated down to your simulator proxies as well. So that's quite nice. Like if you have activate certain things or deactivate certain things, that'll be replicated down technically. We're gonna have our can fly. In this case, I've just said return true because uh, <laughs> there's no real extra logic, but remember we've done that for the sprint. You're always gonna have a conditional check to see if the player can perform a certain action. In this case, yeah, like we're just gonna say true, all good to go. And now here's the extra little thing I added in, right? Because remember, on movement updated, if we go back to our main folder over here, we've said that we have before movement, our update character before movement, our after, and then on movement update is kind of like our last potential chance to change the state for the next tick. So that's what we're doing here. Technically, we could be doing this before movement, 
But in this case, I just wanted to demonstrate how you can also do this on movement updated for the next tick. Because it's percept like the player won't be able to tell the difference, and really, it just depends on your preference. It depends on where you want to do things, what you want to do in certain locations. I think it varies from project to project. Probably different people will disagree on what, where or when to do things, but that's up to you. On movement update is just your last chance to like change state for the next tick. So that's what I did here, right? So on movement update, I've checked to see, you know, am I greater than a simulated proxy? Because we don't want this code once again running on the simulated proxy. And we're going to be checking, because remember, these flags aren't replicated across two simulated proxies. So therefore, we're going to check, like, is this flag active? So there we go. We have our is flag active stuff to see if this new flag is available in our movement flags. And if so, if I can fly, set movement mode to flying. But otherwise, like, oh, if we are actually already flying and stuff like that, then rather just, like, set movement mode back to, if it, well, if it's not active anymore and we are flying, set movement mode to falling instead. And bam, that's all that does there. So it's basically just enter flying or enter falling. Um, actually, there's a bit of a, well, not really a bug, but kind of an oversight here as well, because we're not checking to see, if you technically in this can fly, we'll be saying, if you are not already flying, then you can enter flying. That's basically what we'll be saying, right? So you can see there's kind of a bug here where like, this will technically run every single tick. So that's not great. But luckily, if you're setting the movement equal to a movement mode you're already in, there's actually a fail safe already. That says if you're entering the same movement mode, just return instead. There you go. If you're in the current movement mode equal to the new movement mode incoming, just return instead. So technically, it's not doing any harm. But remember, that is a little, technically a little bug that's been introduced here. So make sure you change your can fly to say, okay, if I'm not flying, then I can potentially enter flying as well as your other parameters. But that's something important to point out here. So technically, there's a little, a little bug or a little oversight over here. I'm going to leave that in. Just, but just thought it would be good to point that out so you can think about your code and be like, oh, I can see where this thing can just keep repeating itself. Anyway, here we have the activate and deactivate flags. Basically, super simple, just, you know, do a little special operator on each one to add and remove flags. <laughs> like I said, you can just go check out this. You can, if you're really curious, you can go Google what these operators mean, but just basically, as I said, adds or activates and then clears or deactivates a flag. And that brings us now to our network prediction loop. Once again, the pattern, we can just start from the top, go down. Are we sending new stuff across to the server? Yes, we're going to serialize our new movement data which is going to be just a little 8-bit, oh, sorry, a byte-long thing, a little 8-bit thing called movement flag custom move data, which we added in. And then when we receive this on the server side, we're moving autonomous, obviously we want to just grab this information. And now this right here, this is where you can start going. If you have extra little uh, booleans available, like you want to separate out all of the flags into booleans, like B wants to fly and B wants to slide and whatever else things you have, you can then go here and say, is flag active from this? Yes, set to true, all that kind of stuff, as well as cache this flag locally as well, if you really want to. But in this case, like I said, what's nice about doing things this way with just the flags is that you can avoid having this proliferation of bulls and stuff like that, and instead have one data structure that you can query instead. So then for like stuff like let's query go down two, instead of having to check each individual bull over here in save move, because remember in save move, we want to save all of those booleans as well if we were using bulls. So we have to like constantly check to see if they'll all change and you'd have like all these bulls. In this case, we can just check to see if our flags are the same or not. Just one little thing over there. And when we fill network data in, we can just grab stuff from the current save movement instead of having to check to see, oh, are our booleans different? Therefore populate our flag system with those bulls. Because once again, basically you'd have, to remember whatever we're doing here, where we're checking to see each individual flag is active within this flag data structure. We have to do the same thing here when we fill that structure by checking to see is the bull like this and that, therefore activate the flag, all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of see how that can become quite tedious, uh, which is why I like this flag approach. You can also ping and query flags from Blueprint based on how we set it up, which is nice. So you don't have to worry about that bool stuff. And you can always cache certain values into a boolean somewhere else if you need to, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, you can kind of see why I like this flag approach. It's nice and clean, one little variable, all done and dusted. Don't have to worry about this proliferation of tons of different booleans as you go along. And once again, we just follow, remember, we just start from the top, we go down the list, and we just follow the pattern, and we go save move, when we, when we set it up for, when we actually populate a save move, we get a from the character movement. The opposite is true, when we replay our move, we're going to set the current state equal to our previously played state, our save state, and then at the end, we're going to clear. And you can see this clear has more oomph, because it's going to clear out potentially eight different boot flags. But I mean, that's not too important. <laughs> but it's good to have your, your pattern in sync, make sure you clear things out, just keep it going. If something seems redundant, it might be redundant, but just add it in any way just to keep the pattern in sync. Because remember, you might need it later for some good reason. So just follow the pattern that's been established. It's always a good, it's always a good idea. <laughs> and you know what? We're done.
We're saying to the, the server, oh, hey, here are these new bit flags. Uh, updates your state based on this. And therefore we go and then I guess, like I said, you can do it on bef in before movement, in after movement if you really want to. I did it over here just for fun, just to show you can use this. And I said, okay, yeah, uh, if our flag is now active, and I suppose it wasn't active before, enter movement mode, enter fly, otherwise exit fly. And of course, importantly, if you when you're activating and exiting things, make sure there's an exit state. So therefore, if we can no longer fly, and we are flying, obviously exit movement flying and do something else. So it's good to check that as well, because obviously you have constraints in that way. Like if you want to check every tick if your fly state has changed, whether or not you can still fly or not, based on your logic. So importantly, yeah, because like I said, clean up after yourself. <laughs> and bam, like that's that's the gist of it, right? We can now activate and remove flags, basically just like flip-flopping our booleans and now it's just sending one lovely little structure across one little variable instead of having to have all these booleans around and it's also more network efficient at the same time so that's why i think bit flags are really nice to use like even if you aren't too keen on them or they seem a little bit tricky or weird like i said just follow the pattern you can see what i've done here you can just follow the pattern add in your own little flags nothing too crazy and if you run out of once again if you run out of flags you can, you can always add more of these and so on and so forth so now let's go and see how we can actually activate this stuff in Blueprints and get our stuff working to actually activate and deactivate flying. Let's just start the project and I'll skip ahead to that. All right, we're back in the project over here. Let's go ahead and open up our character because now remember, we're going to be actually, we're not inferring anything. We're now actually allowing the character or the player to push a button and therefore activate flying. In this case, let's just say they can hit the F key. Like I said, this is not how you'd want to set up your inputs. You'd want to use enhanced input, but like we're going to just do it like this for now. Gab our reference over here, and now we're gonna uh, say activate movement flag upon pressed, and actually we're gonna also flip flop it. Flip flop just you know like I said it's just once you've done the one thing do the other thing instead the next time it's pushed. So now we're gonna activate the movement flag when we hit it the first time, and we want to activate once to fly, not our other flags. You can see it copies the name across nicely. We activate C flag once to fly. And then we want to do the same thing, except we want to, uh, what was it called? Clear movement flag. Yeah, make sure you name your, your function something that makes sense to you. Like I said, I'll deactivate maybe makes more sense if something's called activate, but I just say clear in this case. And we're going to deactivate or clear our wants to fly. Technically, that should all be all we need to do, right? It's the same kind of process as this. We're just requesting, or we're just indicating play intent of it. We're sending one little flag across or, you know, Let's just our pseudo bool that we did before, right? So let's go ahead now and actually play the level. Let's do our little setup again. Once again, if you don't remember what the stuff we did was, we're gonna just first go ahead and say uh, blah, 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 corrections. Set that up. We're gonna go and add in some net lag. Bum bum bum. Make it five hundred. Why not? And let's see if everything's working. Let's see if corrections are on. Yep, and also we do have 500 ping. You can see how long it takes for my movement to update on the server side. So let's go ahead now and jump and push F. Oh, would you look at that? We're flying. And we can't sprint because there's actually a condition that checks to see if we're on the ground when we're sprinting. We could change that to allow you to sprint while flying, but we're not gonna do that for this tutorial here. And boom. We're flying, we're not flying. And remember, we're still at 500 ping here. Everything's good. We can now go to flying and when we can jump up, we can still wall run if we're sprinting. So what you can do is while you're flying, you can hold sprint, approach the wall at the correct kind of angle, exit flying. Oh, messed it up. But technically we should enter and we can now enter flying after jumping away. And now we've got a pretty elaborate little movement system going already just from this little bit of things we've been doing we've added in a new movement mode we've allowed you to enter and exit other modes based on player intent it's all fully network predicted it's all within the saved move structure if a correction occurs on the server it'll replay things properly and bam all happy so there you go that's how you can set up your network prediction stuff that's how you can set up your network movement in your game uh, of course there's a lot more to cover like a lot more to talk about in terms of like how you can get this stuff to work with gameplay abilities and how you can set up your simulation state to work properly with gameplay tags and the addition and removal of gameplay tags and what happens if there's a server correction and rollback of a particular gameplay ability there's a lot of things to consider because the two systems as mentioned 
they don't really they don't really work together too well off the bat but there's a couple of things i want to experiment with in the future so that will hopefully improve how that works or it also could be that epics are really working on a way better system to integrate the two which i'm not familiar with at this time because <laughs> we have to just keep looking at the the github you know the main branch and see how things progress and update but at the moment like i said that's a bit tricky to get done but it's possible and we can we can maybe look into that more in a future video but this should give you some good starter content right here this should get you going this should get your movement abilities going what some people say that they do is that they actually just create their abilities and gameplay abilities but then separate out their movement logic for in a different way so like they kind of separate the two out so you use gameplay abilities for all your usual abilities but you don't activate various things in the movement system like you don't have a jump ability you'd rather just have the jump action that's handled entirely by the character movement component which seems very unintuitive if you want to use gameplay tags and whether or not you're stunned and this and that. But like, yeah, like I said, that's a bit of a trickier topic. Well, I can discuss that. We can talk about potential solves for that. We can test some things out, experiment and play around. But it's a bit tricky, but it's still doable. Like you can still have your, your jump and this and that. Effectively, what I'm also talking about is like properly like refined, robust network code. You could still have all this stuff running in gameplay abilities, activating, deactivating. You just might not have very good rollback support and things like that, which is also okay. I don't think anyone's gonna notice that too much, but I mean, you'll know about it, you know, right? Depends on what you wanna do. Like if you, depending on what kind of project you're making as well, whether it's AAA or indie, whatever the case is, but like, you know, so we'll talk about that stuff at some point. But like I said, it's not too important right now. This is the gist of it. This is the most important stuff. With this, you can probably start thinking of ways to integrate other systems into this. Like bringing gameplay tags across into your network prediction system, checking to see how those tags compare to the server's tags, maybe even hooking into the rollback uh, ID of a particular ability to do and change things on the server side in the character, in the server's character moving component system and setup. So there's a lot of things you can do in that regard, right? But that's, like I said, that's a different video. We won't talk about that now. And also, we're not going to be talking about that in episode three. But I suppose now's a good time to talk about what's going to be going on in episode three. So in episode three, we're going to be going through the same thing, except it's going to be using a plugin that makes all the stuff super accessible to Blueprints. Everything that we just did, the end to exit stuff, the changing and creation of movement modes, can all be done entirely in Blueprints using this particular plugin, which is quite cool, right? So with that, we are done. There's not much more to discuss. Uh, you can you can extrapolate on all the information I just told you and start building your own custom movement modes, start playing around with the content, go ahead and just grab the code. Like I said, it's up on GitHub. Uh, look at the additional reading I, I referenced down below in the description. Check out Del Goody's content. Check out the plugin we're going to be covering in the next episode. And also just like, yeah. You know, just enjoy your development journey. Wish you all the best. Hopefully your project goes extremely well. And uh, please let me know how it goes. You know, send me a message wherever. I'm on Twitter, all those good places. That's not actually a good place anymore. Uh, <laughs> so uh, maybe you know, just drop a comment below. Let me know how your project's going, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, like, follow me on Twitter while it still exists, I suppose. And uh, we'll, if, if I'm not available there anymore, you can find me in other places. I'll drop some links to all the social links below. But yeah, like I said, drop a comment. Let me know if this tutorial series has helped you at all. Let me know if I'm an idiot and you think I'm doing things wrong. I, I always like to learn new things. Uh, yeah, just generally give me your feedback. I'd, be lo I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> so without further ado, let's end it here. And I'll see you in episode three when that becomes available. All right, cheers for now. <laughs>